And we're back. Welcome to episode 212 of No Direction, the Pathfinder News, Reviews, and Interviews podcast. I'm Ryan Costello. And I'm Vanessa Hoskins. Jefferson J. Thacker is on location in Owensboro with Owen Casey Stevens, funny enough. Pretty cool. Apparently, Owen uh, lives like 10 minutes from Owensboro, but chose not to live in Owensboro. I don't understand. If there was a Ryansboro, you know I would find any opportunity to live there. If there was a Ryansboro, I would find any opportunity to live there. Aw, thanks, V. But we're not talking about small towns in the United States today. <laughs> We are talking about the big Advanced Player's Guide playtest that was just released, and we have a member of the Pathfinder Design team join us for, I want to say the first time, but no, that's not accurate, is it? Anyway, we'll get to that in a second. We've got Liz Lydell on the show. Hello, Liz. Hi there. How's it going? Good. Correct me if I'm wrong. You were on like an RPG Superstar special at one point or something, Ooh, right? Uh, very briefly? I was, not. I was very briefly um, backstage at Gen Con this year. Um, we, I was on a couple of the panels um, as things were being live streamed, and I got to come back and chat about um, something that was coming up. Oh, cool. Okay, cool. Uh, for some reason, I thought there was some other appearance. All right, so then let's call this officially your first time on No Direction. Welcome well, to For sure. Yeah, welcome Thank to you the so big much. show. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> So what we like doing when we have a Paizo employee on for the first time is to find your path to Pathfinder. How did you get into gaming and how did it eventually lead you to where you are at Paizo now? Um, so I started getting into gaming when I was in high school. I had some friends who were playing D&D and they were really excited to um, have me join in. And uh, from there, it became uh, a, an ever-growing passion. I started editing for RPGs back in the 3.5 D20 heyday um, as a freelancer. Um, in about 2004, and I did that for um, years, years and years. In 2016, uh, I left my last career and uh, started working full-time as a contract editor here at Paizo. Um, so I was a member of our editing team. Uh, at the beginning of this year, I accepted a position as Paizo's senior editor and uh, started uh, working here in the office in Seattle, which is a, a pretty big change for this Midwestern girl. Um, and then uh, over the summer, I, uh, we, we had a member leave the Pathfinder design team um, that created an opening. I threw my hat in the ring and the design team decided I was the best person for that job. So uh, here I am. I'm, I'm designing the game that, uh, that I love to play. It's kind of a surreal experience. Now, it's interesting. I've heard people say they got into role playing, uh, like the, the business side of it for the a passion to write rules or a passion to write setting. It's rare you hear someone that says my first step into the industry was editing. So how did that come to be? Um, I had, uh, to some degree, it was because I knew the right people. Um, but to another degree, it was because I had editing experience and I was looking for a, a, a career. Um, I was looking to figure out what to do with myself. Um, and I was looking to go more full time into editing. And I loved games. I was at Gen Con. Uh, I made some connections and started um, getting, getting connected with a couple of gigs. And it kind of grew out from there. Uh, I, I'm... Uh, have always been more of a uh, a fixer than than necessarily a spontaneous creator, and so editing is a really has been a very comfortable place for me. It's a, it's very much like getting in and and making things work right. Um, as it turns out, actually, design is not that different. It's taking these ideas and making them work right within the larger framework of the game as a whole. What were some of the you said you were in editing? So what were some of the surprises when you got into game editing specifically? Uh, well, this, when I first got into it, it was, uh, it was kind of wild. Um, so PDF publishing, um, and print on demand was relatively new. Um, the open game license was relatively new. And so everyone in their mother and their dog, um, was opening up their little spin up, uh, you know, publishing company and publishing these one off, you know, usually prestige classes, um, for D and D 3.5. And, um, it was, it was scrappy and it was wild and it was a lot of fun. Um, but it was also scrappy and wild and really wildly unprofessional mm -hmm. and kind of catch as catch can. And, uh, you know, the industry's come a long way since then. I mean, I think, I think very much for the better. And I do think two of the things that got the companies separated them from the rest of the pack were, was art and editing. Those are two really, really big areas. Um, art is really obvious. Um, you know, you have a, a book with great art and you see it immediately. I mean, that's a really obvious thing to to step up your game. Um, but editing is the is the it's the the one that hides in the shadows that you don't notice until it's not there. Um, and it can really make or break a game. A, a, a poorly edited game where the rules don't fit together or where you can't find the information you need. Um, it's 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 a big difference. So when you were added to the design team, or when you earned your spot on the design team, I shouldn't make it sound like you just showed up one day and there you were. <laughs> <Ding>. <laughs> I'm ready at for what, my job now. <laughs> uh, 
at what stage of development was uh, second edition and specifically the advanced players guide? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I uh, joined the design team in September of this year. So um, the Pathfinder second edition had been out in the wild for about six weeks. Um, I should say that leading up to that, um, I was an editor and a developer for the Pathfinder playtest that came out in 2018, and then also for the core rulebook that came out just this past August. So I'm, I have been working very deeply in this game. Um, so it's kind of a natural transition to, to move from editing to development to design. Hmm. Um, and the uh, so we knew the Advanced Players Guide was coming. We had announced it at Gen Con. Um, we knew it was going to have these four classes and um, and we had art for them. And that was it. <laughs> so uh, since I joined this team, um, you know, a couple of months ago now, um, it's been a, a lot of um, moving forward and, and building up. Um, we've got the really fantastic structure of the second edition rules set, um, and we're building it out. We've just finished the um, our work on the game mastery guide, which will be coming out in February. Um, and so that's really building on the rules for the GM side of things. We've got the bestiary, obviously, and then the advanced player's guide is kind of the last book in this, what we think of as sort of like the four table legs, as it were. So you've got the core book, the core bestiary, the GM expansion, and then we'll have a player's expansion coming out at Gen Con of next year. Uh, and so that's um, really, especially in the last couple of weeks, that's where our work has been, has been really digging into this advanced player's guide um, and, and getting where it needs to be so that we can get it into the player's hands. I like the metaphor of the three pillar table because I think in first edition, the advanced player's guide was kind of seen as like the lazy Susan on the table. Like the foundation <laughs> was there and now you've got something that really adds fun to what you're doing. Um, is there a lot of pressure to follow up the first edition advanced player's guide, which revolutionized the game? Hey, revolution, lazy Susan. Hey. Oh, you're right. This thing's around. Um, <laughs> I'm so proud of myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, uh, there's some pressure on it. Um, I don't think we're quite under the same pressure to really re um, to revolutionize the game as a whole. I think second edition has really taken that step. Um, and so as far as the advanced players guide for second edition, it's really more of an expansion upon that big change that's already happened. Um, instead, we're seeing a lot of pressure to take what people really loved and felt very passionately about from first edition Pathfinder and put it into the second edition context in a way that works with both the second edition rules framework and the expectations that our players have of those classes and those play experiences. Now, before we get too far, I do want to remind people that we uh, are speaking to a live switch audience. Vanessa, do you want to tell people what they can do and uh, what advantage they can take of being... <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me try that again. <laughs> or, or maybe I'll just take plug a shot. that you can ask live questions. We stream this show live on Twitch in front of a live audience. So if you'd like to join us at twitch.tv slash no direction, you can join that audience and ask questions of our guest uh, live at any time. We stream no direction, uh, the, this prime podcast twice a month, essentially every other Wednesday, actually three times we did it in October. So it just depends how they fall, I suppose. Uh, and also if you're interested in Starfinder, there's no direction beyond very similar format, but for Starfinder. All right. So Liz, so you said that the APG had already been decided on and announced before you got there, but uh, what were you privy to for the early planning stages? Specifically, I'm curious how these four classes are the ones that ended up uh, making the, the cut. Sure. So we looked um, we looked at a lot of information, a lot of different directions. Um, in the trend in the second half of 2018, um, um, we did a, a bunch of surveys as people. Yes. One second. We're getting some audio popping that I'm actually hearing, which means it's coming through from you. Um, let me see if I can adjust something really quick, please. Yeah, I'm hearing it too. Oh, my video connection has dropped down to a red bar. Okay. Hopefully that's... Uh, how do I sound to you? Uh, yeah, you're coming in and out a bit too. So I think it has to do with this. We may have to restart the stream. I apologize. I... Need My to connection just shot back up to green, if that matters at all. Mm. Chat thinks it's a buffering issue. Specifically, Dungeon Novice. Standing who, by. Uh, a buffer, yeah, maybe. Uh, I'm trying to get the bitrate to the stream a little lower, but I don't. I apologize for the technical issues, folks. OBS decided to lose all my settings about an hour before streaming, so I had to set all this back up. 
Well, I will compliment you that we managed to get on time because we were not going, uh, was not <laughs> looking great for a little bit there. It was a little funky. All right. Uh, folks, I'm going to restart the stream and we'll just jump right back into it. I appreciate your patience. All right, we should be live. Hey, there we are. Okay, I will and wait until I see our video back on the screen. Okay, we'll go a couple of seconds of silence and then pick up where we were. Sounds great. Thanks for staying with us, everyone. Hey, everybody, we're back. Now, Liz, I know you were saying that you were not on the design team at the point that the APG was decided on, but uh, what were you privy to as far as the decision making of what would be in the APG, specifically what classes made the cut? Oh, sure. So when we did the Pathfinder playtest in the second half of 2018, um, one of the components of that was this massive class survey. And one of the questions we asked in that survey was, what classes did you play in Pathfinder first edition? What were your favorite classes? Um, and so that gave us a lot of information to figure out what people were playing, what people really liked. Um, and then when it came time to um, decide which classes we were going to include in the advanced players guide, um, it was a combination of the most popular classes um, and classes that we weren't keeping in our back pocket for maybe other projects down the line. Um, and so we came to the four that we're including in the advanced player's guide, which are the investigator, the oracle, the swashbuckler, and the witch as a very well-rounded group of classes that we could bring forward from first edition into the second edition um, framework um, in really fun and exciting ways that were classes people really loved, they really enjoyed playing, they had really great stories around that fit really well within the narrative of Galarian in our world um, and, uh, and were uh, suitable for this kind of a product. Ooh, suitable for this kind of a product. Can you uh, expand on that? Sure. So um, in, in first edition, we had a, a, you know, something like 40 classes. It was a lot. Um, some of them were very specialized. Um, so uh, take, for example, the Vigilante, which is a really interesting class that does a lot of really interesting things, but is not really, um, it's, it's a little specialized. And so it's not a great option for something like the Advanced Player's Guide, where um, we want these to be broadly applicable, to be um, user-friendly by advanced players, but not hyper-specialized players. Um, and so that, that, that consideration gave us um, a judgment call on, on some of the classes that people really enjoyed, but we decided weren't necessarily a good fit for this book. Um, the, probably the top one that I hear about is the Summoner, um, that we've decided right now that's not the best fit for this book. Um, we will revisit it in the future. People love it. We love it. We just want to be able to do it right. Sure. I am surprised to hear you say the Vigilante was a popular class. I don't know if I've ever been at a table that included a Vigilante in first edition. I don't know that I meant to imply it was um, oh, sorry. <laughs> popular. It was very specialized. Okay, right. sorry. Then maybe I read into what you were saying. Yeah, no worries. No worries. <laughs> I found uh, it was one of those things that was more popular for like a long adventure path, uh, especially if it's taking place in one place or only a couple different locations. Uh, exactly. But for things like society play where you're all over the world, it didn't really make as much right. sense. It was yeah. It, it was a rough rough one for, for organized play for sure. Um, mm -hmm. and, and honestly, it was one of the classes I think we had that um, did, maybe was great for NPCs and mm. kind of odd for for player characters but mm -hmm. uh, that, that one's that one's off the table for now so <laughs> v did you have any broad questions before we start moving into more specifics about the classes starting with the investigator uh not at this time <laughs> actually i guess i have one uh, were there any of the four classes that surprised you that they were as popular as they were or that they were the ones that were chosen um, let me think about what's in here for a while. Um, I think the one that people uh, were not expecting was the swashbuckler. Um, and, and a lot of the responses that we've heard are, why do I need a separate class for this? I can just play a fighter. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the things we've tried to do with the swashbuckler, and I'll talk more about this when we get there, is to make it a martial class that stands alone and has its own merits rather than being a fighter but different, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Sure, that absolutely makes sense. One of the challenges for a lot of the full base attack bonus classes in first edition was, why don't I just play a fighter? Right. It's a great so, question. <laughs> so we want to make sure that there's something there to answer that question and make it compelling. And we will get to some follow-ups, but I figure we'll go in alphabetical order. It's the order okay. that people read the playtest document, sure. which brings us to the investigator. This was of the four classes in the book. Oh, no, I was going to say the latest one added, but no, it was added at the same time as Swashbuckler to first edition. So 
it's not one of the cornerstone ones that was there for the whole uh, lifetime of first edition, but it was definitely a class that made an impact when it was introduced. So just uh, first broadly, what is an investigator? And then how do you bring the investigator into second edition? Sure. So the investigator in first edition was a combination rogue alchemist. It was from the advanced class guide, which were our hybrid classes that blended two different classes together. Um, and so in first edition, we were looking at a character with um, uh, alchemical elixirs, um, the ability to craft alchemical items on the fly, um, lots of skills, just very skill monkey character. Um, and then additionally had a little bit of extra combat flair in the flavor of um, the studied strike ability, um, studied target and studied strike. So you can kind of zoom in on someone um, and, and make an impression on that one target. Um, but probably the most defining feature in, um, I guess it's, it's a distinctive feature in Pathfinder First Edition was the uh, inspiration ability, which was this, um, you know, you get to roll an extra D6 and add it onto your D20 roll for a bunch of different skill checks and a couple of other situations. Um, so what we're looking at is someone who's really uh, out there to, um, you know, to explore the world intellectually, um, to, to get to the heart of things, to understand things, to solve mysteries, uh, to investigate, really. Um, and so those were the core concepts that we wanted to bring forward into the second edition framework. Um, one of the really cool things about second edition is that alchemy is baked into the base system. Um, the core rulebook has a really strong foundation for, um, with the alchemist, um, alchemical items for that kind of crafting. And so it was really easy for us to hook into that for the second edition investigator. Um, but the core of the class, we wanted to stand alone. We didn't want an alchemist who did something different. We wanted something different who did some alchemy. And so uh, the, the class that we've ended up building that we're testing right now is, a, is very much a sort of Holmes-style um, investigator, detective, um, out there to get to, the, to get to the root of things, to figure out what happened, to, 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 to crack the case, as it were. Um, and to that extent, we have a lot of language in the class that speaks to that. Um, the core ability of the investigator in Pathfinder 2nd Edition is called Take the Case, um, and it's uh, very much you have some kind of a, 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 a situation, a location, a creature that is your case that you're trying to figure out. And once you take that case, you get bonuses that help you track it down or find it. Or if you need to, you can, uh, if you get into a fight with it, if it happens to be a creature, um, you can bring those bonuses to bear. Um, sort of tying back to the idea of the investigator's inspiration, but being more proactively tied to what you're doing and how you're, how you're interacting with the world around you. Um, from there, the investigator has three different methodologies. Um, you can be a uh, you can be an alchemical study uh, sciences investigator. That's where your alchemy comes in. Um, so if you like that alchemical piece, you want to have those elixirs and those bombs, you can tap into that. If that's not your jam, then you can take a you can move in a different direction. Um, we have an empiricist path, which is going to be your. I'm all about the um, you know finding those details, honing in on the problem, putting my skills to work. Uh, mm -hmm. Or you can be uh, a specialist in forensic medicine where you really use medicine um, to sort of backtrack and see what's happened in a given situation, which I think is actually going to be a lot of fun in organized play because mm -hmm. how often are you trying to figure out how some poor Pathfinder agent got gacked, right? <laughs> oh, right. Exactly. Well, I like also, that... Also, as the GM... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, B. I like that they start with the battle medicine. So if you're playing that particular path, you're automatically going to have this you know, battle healer sort of medic on your team, which is great with the way healing and everything has been working in, in second edition. Right. And um, it just sort of taps into that and brings all of that to bear um, for mm -hmm. the whole party. Yeah. And as a GM, like I prefer this method to finding out about, you know, my plot that I'm dying for people to find out about rather than like you just cast the right divine spell. This feels like you're earning it. It's a little bit more interactive and it's a little bit more player decision based. Mm -hmm. It sure is. Um, and one of the things that we um, found when we were working with the investigator um, is that the um, it's it is of the four classes that we've introduced. It's the one that has the least mechanical tie in to really rigid framework structures. It's the class that's going to require the most um, interaction and play back and forth between the GM and the player so that we can really see um, you know, so that GM can kind of lead those clues on and sort of peel back the veil of what's going on um, and give the investigator those rewards. That's one of the biggest things that we're wanting to play test about this class uh, because we don't have the, 
we, we don't necessarily know how well that's going to work. We don't know if that's something that all GMs are going to be comfortable with. Um, we don't know that that's going to be something that all players are going to find rewarding. If you'll give me one second, I'm having a little bit of a technical problem that I'm going to ask for some help here with. Sure, no sure. problem. I can still hear you, and uh, I'm perfectly happy to keep chatting. I just needed to look away for a minute. That's fine. Uh, okay, one great. thing that um, I'm going to mess this up. Uh, Elfith. Elfie Saroth uh, in chat says is that the, it synergizes very well with the Alchemist dedication. Uh, Rise Sky 90 says an Alkagator. <laughs> an Alkagator. Uh, but yeah, I like that too. So if you really want to lean in, oh, I'm sorry, it's Elf Tarot. I never would have guessed. Um, <laughs> if you really <laughs> wanted to lean into that uh, very chemistry sort of thing without going full Alchemist with all the bombs and everything, this is a great way to go like scientist you know forensic scientist right for sure and if you really do want to like just dive into the alchemy whole hog that mm -hmm. that alchemical dedication and multi-classing into alchemist is going to just like double up and let you really become a powerhouse there mm -hmm. you also said it's about a, like a player gm relationship but i liked how many of the class features bring in the whole party that it's like all right i'm on the case here's how you all benefit from me being <laughs> on the case how we can all work together exactly um, we wanted to speak to kind of the, not just Sherlock Holmes, but the Holmes-Watson dynamic, where you've got this character who's noticing things, who's making these connections, but they can be like, oh, hey, guys, look at this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's not just you as the investigator doing your own thing while everyone else does something else. Yeah, one of the complaints I had about first edition was that uh, the best way to get rid of traps is for the party to not have a rogue, because then the GM's not adding all these things that are just for the rogue to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> that's, Where, that's a solution <laughs> <laughs> whereas with the investigator it doesn't have that same problem because all the things that the investigator is dealing with are already there it's the plot it is what is making the adventure an adventure right exactly every adventure should have some kind of a plot that this should be able to hook into so we're really excited to see how this plays out um there's a lot of um this is not one of the classes that I worked on particularly closely, um, but one of the things I really love about it is that the designers, Mark and Logan, um, really got very creative with the names, and they're just fantastic names oh, yeah. for the abilities, um, from take the case and clue in um, to things like just one more thing. Oh, that was my favorite. I'm so <laughs> glad you brought that one up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Elftro yeah, was we're, saying we're, that, we're clue in, with that clue in makes him very happy. So, <laughs> Oh, good. Excellent. Excellent. I like a, one of my favorite things about just one more thing is that you only get one more thing. It is just add. one more <laughs> it thing. It really is. Because, yeah. <laughs> like, can you imagine if Columbo was ever like, just one more thing, and then just bombs with the one more thing that he's, <laughs> he thought was his ace in the hole? <laughs> yeah, but it's it's such a fun it's such a fun ability, and and it's so iconic to this genre of of investigation that we're trying to tap into and let you explore in your gameplay experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's kind of what we're seeing with the advanced players guide and why why we're tackling these classes. We want to give you ways to engage with the game that you can't already. Um, so finding you know where's what does this new space look like? What is what does this idea look like in the second edition rules set? Now on the subject of flavor. I found first edition Alchemist, or sorry, not Alchemist, Investigator was very clearly Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, which had come out just a couple of years before. It was like, that's the most clear inspiration for this class. Mm -hmm. Whereas this one, it just feels like it's a broad variety of Holmeses, as well as like the Columbo influence we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. There's sure. a lot more investigators to this investigator. Right. Um, we wanted to make sure that we're not locking you into only playing investigators the way one person envisioned them but that you can bring whatever your inspiration for this kind of a story is you can bring it to the table v any final thoughts on the investigator uh i'm looking forward to bringing it to pathfinder society and just like helping the whole table feel like they're they're excellent at skills with things like clue in and clue them all in and things like that i think it's going to be great well so i hope then. so um i'm hoping people get out there and um we're, we're really looking for, as we go through this playtest, we're really, really excited to have results, not results, um, information and feedback from people who are playing these classes at the table. Um, you know, I love hearing what people are saying on the message boards and what people's reactions to the classes are, but we also really need that experience-based data. So if you if you have a game coming up in the next couple of weeks and you have a chance to, to whip up one of these characters and play them for a session or three, that's super, super valuable to us, um, and uh, and we will love you for doing it. Uh, one thing that I also really liked is uh, that you brought back the art, uh, right? The the Wayne Reynolds sketch art, just like from the original playtest. I just think that's really cool. It just really gives that sort of like, 
I don't know. We're in the process of building this. It's not yet complete sort of It's not vibe, finished. But like in a good way. Right. Well, and it kind of speaks to what we're trying to do, much like we had with the original playtest last year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're trying to see if this stuff is going to work. You know, this, sure. isn't, this isn't a video game beta where it's 98.95% done and we're just mm -hmm. looking for you to help us catch typos. You know, right. we're, we're really looking to say, like, does this work at all? Everything is on the table. If this whole class is really broken and everyone hates it, we'll throw it out and we'll try something else. Um, and so it, so it really is, you know, that it, first of all, your feedback really does matter because mm -hmm. we, we are listening, we're reading, we're watching, um, and, and we are going to make changes based on it. But also because, um, you know, it's, there's so much potential here to, to, to move these forward and get them to be what we want them to be. Like, I know from a player perspective, yeah, I really appreciate that uh, the design team is really taking everyone's feedback into consideration. I know that Pathfinder 2 playtest had some mixed reviews, some concerns from people, and all of those seem to have been answered because Pathfinder 2, its finished product, is light years ahead. So when I talk to people and they're like, oh, well, in the playtest, I'm like, forget it. Pretend it didn't exist. <laughs> Trust me, Pathfinder 2 is like super good. Anything that anyone had a complaint or concern about or thing that they did, thought, ooh, this might not work right, it's all been smoothed over. And I think that's really great that the design team is taking that sort of feedback to heart. Yeah, it's worked out so well for us and mm -hmm. really has helped us make a fantastic game. So, hey, let's let's keep doing what works. Exactly. Yeah, there was a decision that's in this playtest that has ruffled some feathers. Mm. All right. And that is um, Oh, boy, you have to go there. <laughs> the, uh, I'm going to uh, offer a, a groan to that pun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the... The former... Alahazra, the former Oracle iconic, has been retired and mm -hmm. has been replaced by, uh, as yet, as far as I know, unnamed Tengu iconic. Mm -hmm. uh, that's correct. Um, so one of the things that the Advanced Player's Guide is doing, and maybe we should have started this by giving an overview of what's in this whole book. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> so we got cut we off by technical let's, difficulties. Right, let's oh, back up for a second. My... Um, the, uh, the Advanced Player's Guide is a player-facing supplement that's going to touch on everything that you as a player would be using in this game. Um, so obviously we have the four classes that we're playtesting, but we also are bringing in uh, 10 new ancestries, um, as well as additional options for the existing ancestries, additional options for the existing classes, 60 pages. Uh, it, it's Between them all, it's going to be 40 new archetypes for you to play. We know that archetypes are a huge part of Pathfinder and we want to get those into your hands. Um, and then from there, we're going to have new feats, new skill feats, new spells and rituals, new focus spells, um, and items and magic items for you to play with at your table. Um, so coming back up to the Oracle, um, one of the things we noticed in really exploring our iconics um, for the new edition, um, as we were, you know, we've updated the designs for everyone. So Valoros has a shield now, um, Sioni has a little bit more clothing. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of making sure that everyone's new appearances match to the, uh, to, to the game and what they're doing in this new edition of the game. Um, but our, uh, Iconics were very human centric and, um, you know, we had a few, we have a couple of halflings, we have a couple of gnomes, we've got an elf, but really the vast majority of them are humans. And because the APG is bringing in these new ancestries to the table, mm -hmm. um, we wanted to incorporate that into the Iconics. Um, and so uh, we had this iconic character that we really, really liked, um, who's on the cover of the Advanced Race Guide from Pathfinder First Edition. Go pull uh, out your hardcover and take a look at it. You'll see this guy. He's, uh, he's in the upper right hand of the corner. Um, and and we've wanted to work with him for an interesting figure. Like, who is that guy? Why is he on the cover of this book with the other iconics? Like, what's the story there? Oh, um, yeah. And so this really gave us an opportunity. Is he? It's right there. Um, so this gave us an opportunity to really explore that story to change up our iconic characters a little bit um, to the uh, to to the table as. Alhazra is not um, going anywhere. She still exists in our world, just like Damiel does. Um, there, she, there he is. She will. She will still be in this book. Oh, excellent! Mm. <laughs> Magic of technology. I know. Um, so we're not in the business of killing off characters, um, and we're really not even in the business of retiring them. Um, you know, we'll, we'll still see favorite iconics um, who aren't necessarily the primary iconic anymore, but they still exist in our world. Their stories are still going. Um, so they'll they'll still be around. They're they're still here, and they're still part of the universe that we really love. But we don't know anything about this Tengu besides that we're going to find out more about him. Yeah, we don't. We him? will. <laughs> Is it a him? Uh, we're we're not actually even sure about that yet. Um, we're having a lot of conversations in the office about 
um, who this oracle is. Part of it actually depends on what the class ends up doing. Um, so, hey, look at that slick segue into the class. Oh. Um, the Oracle is one of the classes that's changed a little bit from first edition, um, where we've taken um, the really core idea of you're a divine spellcaster who's tapping into this great cosmic deific divine power. And either because you're trying to tap into the domain of, you know, multiple gods at once and you're mm -hmm. just being crushed by the conflicting anathema that they all have because you can't possibly meet them all at the same time or you're just like reaching straight into the divine well and you don't have a safety filter on and it's just <laughs> kind of like kicking back at you all the time um, you have this curse that manifests as you use that divine power um you know this is really the the iconic um central concept of the oracle in first edition um, we're trying to update the concept to work more smoothly with the second edition rules so that we can still keep that idea, but do it in a way that's going to be fun, that's going to be fulfilling, and that people are going to be really happy with. Now, uh, similar to what you were saying about the swashbuckler where people were saying, why don't I just play a fighter? I was surprised the Oracle was included because the sorcerer is now has access to divine the divine spell list. So before we got the playtest, when we just knew Oracle was included, I was like, well, what are they even going to do with the Oracle? That was sure, and I that's was a great yeah, it's a great question because really the biggest the the biggest you know the the, the job of the Oracle in first edition was it's the divine spontaneous caster, um, and that's that position has now been um, opened up to other uh, other directions. So so yeah, what does the Oracle do? Um, and so what we're looking at is really is really digging into, um, you know, what is the mystery that you have as your oracle? You're tapping into this mystery that's some kind of um, universal concept. Um, and it's there's a lot of ways you can get to this universal concept. You might be you might be tapping into the portfolios of multiple deities. Um, you might be pulling this power out of the sort of um, ambient gestalt energy that humanity and, and all sapient races have of this concept. Um, you might be just going straight to the source and, and tapping into it yourself. Um, but regardless of that, you're, you're working with the singular concept. And so you have powers um, that, that spring from that concept. The three that we're testing in the playtest are battle, life, and flames, um, which all three of them were very popular Oracle mysteries in Pathfinder first edition. Mm -hmm. uh, but something we've done differently here in Pathfinder second edition is uh, we have taken the curses um, which used to be sort of sta standing alone. You would pick your mystery and you'd separately pick your curse and that would sort of define your oracle. Um, we have kind of tied them together so that you're tapping into a certain um, conduit of power to get certain abilities, but that power comes with a price and the price matches the power that you're drawing from. Okay. Uh, what this has done for us is it's let us make really fantastically flavorful curses um, that really speak specifically to the mystery that you've taken uh, because we don't have to try and... Uh, balance out every possible combination of any mystery and any curse that we could possibly come up with because they're tied together. Um, we can do really, really wacky, interesting things that we wouldn't normally be able to do. So you don't now, just have is... an army of haunted oracles or blind oracles. <laughs> exactly. Um, or legalistic oracles. <laughs> or legalistic, a lot of legalistic yeah. oracles out there. Um, and, and part I mean, of, I mean, technically, part of is... yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just about the Are legalistic. Just being legalistic. Yes. <laughs> Good, good. Um, so uh, this is an area that we've already gotten a lot of feedback on because it's a significant change. Um, in, in some ways, we've kind of taken a choice out of the player's hands where you used to have these two choices to customize your character. We've actually consolidated them down. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's something that we're not sure if it's going to fly or not. Um, we want to see if the um, trade-off of having um, a really more tailored curse that's more flavorful and specific, that's specifically tied to the mystery um, is something that people are excited to play and find fulfilling, or if they feel that that's going to be too limiting um, and, and not something that they enjoy. Uh, the other big thing that we've done with the Oracle in second edition is we've taken the idea of that curse and said, this is the price you pay for your power. Mm -hmm. And so the more of that power you pull, the more your curse is going to affect you. Um, and so you start off every day and you're like, okay, like I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. Hey, let me go grab some of this divine. Ow. <laughs> uh, and it starts to, it starts to bite you. It starts to, it's, you know, it start, you start to have that sort of splashback. Mm -hmm. um, and the more of it you pull, the worse your curse gets. At first it's a, it's a relatively minor effect. Um, it's going to stay with you the rest of that day. So if once you, once you make that, once you go, you're not going back. Um, Throughout the rest of the day, as you push um, your curse, you can push it further and then back off and push it further and then back off. Uh, as you push it further, 
it becomes not just uh, a detriment, but also starts to have positive side effects. Um, okay. So for the um, for the uh, Oracle of Life, um, with the life mystery, um, your curse makes it harder for other people to heal you. Um, you, you your oh. sort of life is outpouring from you. So you can push healing magic out, but it's real hard to reverse the flow and make it go the other way. Now that's but a side effect of that is that you start getting a bunch of extra healing magic. Right. Um, it's a little wacky and uncontrolled because you're not doing this in a precise measured way. Um, you know, but, but it's there and it's powerful. Um, okay. so, you know, so this, go ahead. I was going to say, so in first edition, I know you started with a pretty big negative and almost no positives. And then as you uh, continued on, you sort of turned those negatives into positives into by getting positives. more power. You're saying on this right. one, it's more of a, not only a, a, a per day choice, like how far you're willing to push it, but also as you advance, both the curse and the benefits get more intense. That's exactly right. And okay. then as you level cool. up, then um, you kind of tap into bigger, more extreme effects. So as when you first start out, um, you can you can push yourself into your curse, but you can only go so far. As you as you gain levels, you can push yourself further. You get bigger benefits. You also get bigger drawbacks. Um, you know, at super high levels, when you are up against the big bad and you really need to just throw down one more spell to take out the boss, you can. Mm -hmm. It's going to kick you out of the game for a little while. Um, so you've got this progressive. Um, you know, the sort of progressive curse that you're sort of navigating and, and flexing with throughout the course of gameplay. That's wildly different than anything we have done before. Mm -hmm. We don't know if it's going to work. Um, <laughs> we've had people saying it's, that they really enjoy it and they think it's really interesting. Uh, we have people saying that they absolutely hate it and that they will never play an Oracle. And we have people and, and we have, a, you know, a lot of people in the middle, um, you know, maybe the idea is OK, but, you know, this particular curse isn't necessarily balanced. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that's one where we really, really want to see this in action at the table um, to see what it looks like when we run it through encounter after encounter, when you run it through an entire day of adventuring. Um, you know, it, are you getting enough bang for your buck to to cast these special spells that, that manifest your divine power? Um, or is that price too high? You're not willing to cast them. So um, there's a lot of a lot of changes that we've seen with the Oracle, um, you know, a lot of really interesting ideas. We'll, you know, and we'll see if they pan out. If they don't, then we'll find something else that's that's going to meet what people want out of this class. I really enjoy that last effort of like, once you've gone too far, you have the chance to do it one more time, but you'll be knocked unconscious for eight hours with no way of being revived. Because like, narratively, you see that all the time in fantasy fiction, but the closest thing we had was either a heroic sacrifice, you probably just good, Final, lost your last hit. Done. Right, yeah. Right. You didn't do anything especially good. You just did it until you couldn't do it anymore. Or right. you just went Nova. And then when you were done, you're like, well, I'm still fine. I just <laughs> used all of my power and I'm okay. So, like, I almost, I look forward to the chance to just blow <laughs> every single opportunity until I have nothing left except for this one last ditch effort, this Hail Mary shot. It's, it is right. I, <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, crazy uh, yeah. I also really liked the narrative of how the curses go because I, I am planning on playing a battle curse for the play uh, sorry a battle oracle for the playtest, mm -hmm. and I like that for the the minor curse, you get a minus two penalty, but you can ignore it just by striking. It almost feels like well, I might as well just do this. It's <laughs> it's no penalty at all. But what I've actually done is I've got a strike against me now. Mm. Right, right. Um, and it, it's it's interesting because it's um, the idea that we really wanted to to take forward with that curse in particular is you have these these spirits this um, this 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 energy of battle that's kind of in your mind all the time that's driving you into battle and as long as you're in a fight you're great and as soon as you get out of it you're just like oh my god I want to die <laughs> <laughs> you're and, just done. And so, <laughs> um, and so you know we went through a couple of iterations of how do we represent that. Um, you know, we had, we had one duration was actually just fatigued outside of combat, but then we realized that fatigued is actually really, really rough outside of combat. And that wasn't quite what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so, you know, that's, that's kind of true for a lot of these things, like the, the Hail Mary, uh, where, where you can cast once more and fall unconscious. Um, you know, we're not sure if we've hit that in the right spot. You know, mm -hmm. is that, is that the right effect for this? We don't know. Maybe the concept is great, but taking out of the game for eight hours is not what we need to do. Maybe we just yeah. maybe we just drop you to zero hit points or make you doomed a bunch or something. You know, we'll 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 see what we get when we you know when we hear that feedback. Yeah, I leave you stunned for like a random number of rounds. So you're like, well, I know I'm going to be out of the fight, but it might be a long time. You know, even right. to do four rounds. Right. So, yeah, four rounds is like <laughs> it's a lot of combat. <laughs> you know, but it's not the rest of the so, day. So um, right from chat. Yeah. So there's a, there's a oh, lot I'm of sorry. directions. Yeah, go ahead. 
uh, before I just don't want to miss this uh, miss this question from chat. Crazy Sitch five one nine is worried about Alahazra asking if they're being replaced as the Oracle means what it means for her and lore. Does she still have her powers? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Okay. Um, and our, our intention is that she's staying in the world. She exists okay. in the world. She's still an Oracle in the world. She'll still be an Oracle of Flame. Um, mm -hmm. Because we're still figuring out exactly how the curses work, mm -hmm. um, we're not sure um, what her lore... We don't, want to, we don't want to retcon anyone's existence or backstories. Sure. Um, but we need to make sure that what we do with the curse is... Um, it, we can that we can represent that with Alhazra, and so we haven't okay. said a lot about what she's doing in lore, um, just because we we kind of need to nail down mechanically what what is going to happen here before we can definitively say how that's going to look in the new edition. And that's actually the exact same reason why our new iconic doesn't have any details yet, uh, because it's it's a little hard to give them details when the whole mm -hmm. class is so up in the air. Sure. Now for the battle oracle's moderate curse, it says that you get fast healing as long as you're in a non-trivial encounter. Does mm -hmm. that mean? you could just find another battle oracle and just fight until you're both healed? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't... I, sure, I guess there's yes. a possibility. <laughs> so, so two battle oracles, the combat's done. Everyone else is like, uh, I got to take my 10 minutes. I'm getting and my we're focus like, no, points. We gotta keep going. And they're just like, all right, we're just going to spar. We're just going to straight up <laughs> duel each other for like as yeah, long as it takes. the end of Rocky Three. <laughs> right. I mean, and the, and the key there is is that it's non-trivial, right? So if, mm -hmm. if you're sparring and everything's non-lethal and you're not dealing damage, that's really not a threatening encounter. Okay. Um, and so we, you, you, you would need to find an opponent that is that is a non-trivial threat um, and, and actually be in, in an encounter um, that, that would have that threat level apply. So two battle oracles. I just oracles. read that as you can't <laughs> kick a puppy. So you <laughs> also can't kick a puppy. That's I mean, right. you could, it just won't heal you. Uh, yeah, actually, the, the instance that came up when we were talking about it was, what about the person who just brings a pack animal along and is just like, whack, whack, <laughs> whack. We're like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> hey, you stupid Please. donkey. It's like, oh. oh. Don't abuse yeah, the we, donkey. We didn't, yeah, we didn't want to go there. So we, we wanted to, we wanted to make it, you know, and, and like that's not going to satisfy these, this battle zeitgeist either. So, um, you know, you've really got to, you've got to be in it for the money. Uh, Roscoe Edeleb says that they really love the diverse array of human types you can pick for your character in the guide and love how players who pick humans can pick all these different diverse people. Uh, will there be more of that for the other races and future content releases? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, we have a lot of that already actually in the Lost Omens character guide, which just came out this month oh. um, or maybe just at the, at the end of October. It's a very, it's okay. a relatively new release. Cool. Um, but it really digs into character options within the world of Galarian. And so that's where you're gonna see a lot of the ethnic groups um, explored in detail, not just human ethnic groups, um, but also ethnic groups for all of the other ancestries that we have in the game so that you can really um, fine tune that character, figure out where they're from, figure out what that means for them and gain some mechanical benefit for it as well. All right. I want to be excited, but I feel like I've been burned by this before. <gasps> well, I feel like there's a story here. Oh, no, just from uh, my review of the character guide, it was like, why? Why is it only humans that get ethnicities? Like, <laughs> I don't understand. So uh, uh, it's, it's complicated, but that's probably a question for another time. <laughs> yes, uh, that's, I, I shouldn't have brought it up. No worries. <laughs> uh, one of the criticisms I've seen for the Oracle is that the class feats are basically just the generic spellcaster feats that a lot of the other classes already have. Um, is that intentional? Is that what's the purpose there? Sure. So um, what we are worried about um, with the Oracle, um, I'm going to ask Aaron here to give me a hand again, because I'm really good at this technology thing. Um, the, the computer that I'm on keeps going to sleep and it's not my computer. So I have to get someone else to come put the password in so I can see <laughs> your lovely faces again. Um, but the, the, the thing that we really need to test with the Oracle is, is not whether it has interesting feats, but that mystery curse um, setup and whether that's going to work. And oh. so, the feats we kind of intentionally kept pretty generic because uh, that's not actually what we need to test. We know that we can build class feats. We've, we have, we've, okay. we've built that structure out. We know how that's gonna work. Um, we need to know if this core thing works. So that's where we want your attention. And if we had a bunch of really interesting, exciting feats, then people would get- uh, Distracted. You know, there, there, there would be a distraction there. And we really gotcha. wanna keep the attention on the core for, for the play test. Now in the final book that we have a lot more room to play with, we're gonna have more options. So we'll be able to really dip into more flavor that's gonna be able to let you build out your class the way you can with the classes in the core rule book. Do you know how many mysteries we can expect in the final book? 
I am I am thinking four right now. Okay. Um, so we want we want to stick with the three we have right now, and then we'll have a fourth one for the iconic um, mm-hmm. that we we haven't we've had some conversations about we haven't pinned down yet. Okay. So I was expecting either just the three or a lot more than the three. I'm surprised it's just one that didn't make the play test. Mm. Um, it's more that uh, there's one more that we know we have to have. And then I'm not sure. I'm honestly just not sure how much page count we'll have to put more in. Okay. Um, the mysteries are going to be a place where we do want to have a lot of options, but it's also a place where we can build them in future products down the road. Gotcha. Any advice for my three level battle Oracle build before we move on? Uh, uh, let me know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm playtesting and keeping that oh. data to myself. <laughs> you can playtest it yourself if you want to know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know how it goes. Awesome. Actually, uh, before we move on to the Swashbuckler, do you want to remind people how they can let you know how it goes? Oh, yeah, for sure. To Paizo.com. Um, there is a um, panel up right now for the Advanced Players Guide playtest. Um, and you can, from there, link to... Um, both download the um, playtest classes yourself. It's totally free, easy download. Um, You can go grab it right now. Um, And linked in there is uh, our links to the two surveys that we're using to collect um, our our data feedback on these classes. Um, So uh, we can probably put those links into the chat right now. Oh, yes, I've got them. Excellent. Um, Ryan's gonna gonna pull through for me. And uh, and then we also have um, uh, also at Paizo.com, we have a big community forum where people are talking about these classes and sharing their opinions and sharing their ideas about what they're seeing. Um, we've got some test builds going on in there. We've got some people raising some questions. It's also where we're posting a couple of clarifications because like any document, this one has a couple of errors that have needed some clarification. So um, <laughs> okay. that's where we're making those little those little tweaks. Oops, this is this feet got in at the wrong level. Here's where it's supposed to be. Um, so, uh, and those any... will all be cleaned up in the final version. Okay. Were there any major clarifications for the first two classes that we've already covered? Um, I am not aware of any for the investigator. Um, for the Oracle, the biggest one is that there's a mismatch between what it says in the text and the table for how many mm-hmm. spells you oh. get per day. The table is correct. Okay. okay. Uh, from chat, Hero, Li- Hero Icarus wants to know if there will be new subclasses and options for existing classes. Just before I forget. Yes, that question. is something that we will be bringing in for um, all 12 of, the, uh, 12 of the core classes. Fantastic. While we're on the subject, it seems subclass is the community name for the other options within the class, but it hasn't been officially embraced in any rulebook. Are we ever going to get an official name for this category of option? Uh, that's a great question. Um, as an editor, I hate that there's no official name for them <laughs> yet. Um, as, uh, so that's something that I would love to do is to, you know, ideally we could call them, I don't know, paths. Yeah, paths, paths is what I've mostly finder. been using, yeah. Um, yeah, but we, we don't actually have an official term for it yet, and I would I would like to to pin one down so that you can talk about these things in a consistent way that's you know shared between everybody who's reading the books. So if I'm playing Pathfinder and I'm finding a path, I'm really just selecting a class and a subclass. Yeah, there you go. You've won. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> done. <laughs> uh, are there other ways that your experience as an editor has changed the dynamic of the design team? Um, it's a little bit of the, the strengths we bring to the table. Um, I have a lot of attention. Oops, I have sort of two big areas where I give a lot of attention. One is in language precision. Um, I want, I have a lot of experience um, making things and presenting information in an organized way and making sure that the wording is very clear and precise. Um, and so those are things that I can really bring when we're trying to do something and we want to make sure that the wording for it is, is, is clear. Um, and, and, uh, you know, not going to cause ambiguities. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the other thing that I did a lot of work on when I was on the editing team is a lot of um, inclusivity and diversity work, uh, making sure that our games are um, not promoting harmful stereotypes, that we're making a play space that's inclusive to as many people as we possibly can. Um, and so that's kind of a, a, an angle that I keep in mind when I'm working on um, a lot of these design things. How can we, um, you know, what kind of design decisions are we making and what kind of an impact is that going to have um, you know, if we have a spell called insanity versus a spell that's called nightmare, um, you know, what are what are what messages are we sending, um, and how are how can we make this game as inclusive as possible uh, while still keeping it a, a, a real interesting game? Mm-hmm. There are a couple of Oracle related questions from chat, and then we really do have to move on to the swashbuckler because <laughs> we are getting a long yeah. on time. Uh, Rysik. 90 wants to know, will mysteries each have only one curse or will they get a selection of curses? That's a great question that we're exploring. Um, I don't have an answer for that yet. 
And Smot Goblin wants to know, will oracles be able to choose between different spell categories like the sorcerer? Um, that is not something, I think that uh, by that question is asking if they'll have access to different traditions. Mm -hmm. That is unlikely to happen with the oracle because the oracle is um, really specifically a divine spellcaster. Um, and so barring really unusual archetypes, um, which like maybe not off the table, but definitely not in this book, um, they're, they're going to be primarily divine. Okay. All right, swashbuckle me. All right. So the swashbuckler is, um, is I, I don't want to say any of our classes are unfun, but the swashbuckler is the <laughs> fun This class. is the good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, full disclosure, I didn't really work on this one a whole lot either. Um, I, did, I did some additional development and uh, design on it, but um, this one really came out of Mark Seifter. Um, and the swashbuckler in, in Pathfinder First Edition was a full martial character um, whose um, core mechanic kind of revolved around panache. Mm -hmm. um, you've got this state of flair and... Um, and you do awesome things with it. And we're like, that's amazing. We love that. That's what we want in the Pathfinder Second Edition Swashbuckler. Um, but the idea, the the way Panache worked in First Edition didn't really do what we wanted it to do because so many abilities were. If you have any Panache, doesn't matter how much, then you can do stuff. And then sometimes you can spend individual Panache points, mm -hmm. um, and that was a little bit weird. So in Second oh. Edition, we have made Panache just a binary state. You you either have Panache or you don't. You've got it or you're going to try and get it. Okay. Um, and when you have rage. Panache, it's, <laughs> it's fancy rage. <laughs> it's you don't have to spend rage. an action to do it. <laughs> oh my um, gosh, so I love it. You, you, um, you go out and you do awesome things and you show off and you demonstrate how awesome you are. And then in doing so, you get panache. And everyone's like, ooh. And then while you have panache and everybody's making googly eyes at your moves, then you stab people really hard. And doing so... <laughs> sort of expends the panache. Everybody's like, oh, that's what it was for. And then you've got to earn your panache again before you can use that finishing move. Um, so the, the swashbuckler exists in a cycle of taking actions to gain panache, um, using that panache to perform finishers, which are these big, brilliant maneuvers that you use at the end of your turn. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, you, you eventually gain the ability to use reposts, which after you use a finisher, you have access to special reactions that you can sort of follow up um, to you know, to give one last one last stab as you're as you're tumbling away, uh, and and so far this has been um, a class that's been really well received. Um, the, the the core mechanic is is encourages a lot of um, moving around the battlefield, um, getting up in people's faces, getting away, talking yourself up. Um, you've got the three paths within the swashbuckler are the uh, acrobat. Um, I'm sorry, it's renamed to gymnast, so we didn't come, but you could go over a skill. Very um, good. You're a gymnast, which you're just, you're all over the place. You're the one swinging off your chandeliers. Uh, the fencer, so you're the one with the flourishing sword moves and your dueling cloak. Um, or the braggart, where you're just out there to tell people how awesome you are and make them believe it. And then back up your words with actions. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it's it really has been the class that has been... Um, you know, we, we introduced the Firebrands as a new um, faction in the world in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And this is the class that really speaks to the Firebrands. These are the people who are going to run up and say, Aha! I've got you now! Um, and just make a big ridiculous show of themselves, um, you know, taking out the queen or the corrupt captain of the town guard or, or you know, the head cultist or whoever they need to take out um, because they can and they love showing off while they're doing it. We were talking about how in first edition the challenge was for other full base attack bonus uh, classes to differentiate themselves from the fighter. And I do think of the swashbuckler in that category of like a real martialist. So mm -hmm. I was surprised it's not an expert in any kind of weapon. At uh, least not from the get go. That's an interesting point. Um, yeah. I'm not sure that I had specifically looked at that. Um, Although now that I'm thinking about it, I think we probably did have some conversations about it. The fighter is the leading edge of weapon proficiency. Um, and uh, okay. the, the design intent of the game is that no one will ever be as good with weapons as the fighter because that is their deal. Um, and so the swashbuckler um, is, it, it, we, we don't want to have it have the fighter's deal and then do something else. Um, so we're giving it this sort of other set of abilities sort of, um, I don't want to say in, in place of, but... Um, that make it special to, as opposed to just raw talent or raw skill. Exactly. Okay. Right. If the fighter is focusing on training with these weapons to be the best at these weapons, the swashbucklers over here like, well, anyone can use a sword, but can you do this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think people who are just listening to this podcast are going to really, they're missing out on that little <laughs> you really finger are. flail you just <laughs> you winked at us. <laughs> uh, not finger flail, finger foil. That's right. I, I'm, I'm uh, uh, dueling with my, with my finger over here. <laughs> the, the foil of fingers. Excellent. I was also surprised just how many mentions of unarmed strike and how much the swashbuckler can do without a weapon. Sure. Um, this has sort of two facets. Um, one is that we, we don't want to lock the swashbuckler into having to use a weapon. Mm -hmm. um, among other things, we actually have a lot of love for um, improvised weapons. <laughs> you can grab whatever's around and use it in a fight. Uh, but another piece that's happened is that um, because uh, simple weapons and unarmed strikes are actually two different categories of things, uh, we can't just say you can use something for a weapon. We actually have to specifically call out that you can also do it with an unarmed strike. Otherwise, you can't. Um, and then you get into weird situations where you can um, you can use an ability if you're punching someone with a dagger, but you can't use it if you're punching them with your fist. And that gets real weird real fast. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's some of it is just a, a language clarity issue that we're making sure we cover all of our bases. Um, there are um, we've mentioned this before in uh, some of the Pathfinder Second Edition errata for the core rulebook that uh, unarmed attacks are getting rolled into a lot of places where you haven't seen them before. Um, and so this is part of what you're seeing is an extension of that change where we're, we're specifically calling this out so they don't get accidentally omitted. And uh, what about natural weapons? Because something like Twin Finisher says you need two melee weapons. Does that preclude the lizard folk with all of their natural weapon options from a, being able to yeah. swashbuckle with their tail? With their tail, that's a great question. Um, and that's, that's the kind of thing that we want to think about um, as, as we go forward, because, you know, were we thinking about lizard folk with tails while we were designing this class? Not really. We were having a lot of conversations about swinging on chandeliers. Right. Um, so, <laughs> so, the so tail. Might... <laughs> Obviously. Uh, so th that's an opportunity where we have some, um, you know, where that feedback is going to make a difference and point out things that, you know, is this, do we want to limit this only to weapons or do we want to let you actually just punch people and, and pull a twin finisher that way? Yes. Punch people, please. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> For me, every class is a monk. That's my goal. Play every class as an un unarmed as an master. Mm -hmm. Got to do it. I have some surprises for you. Ooh, well, then I'm, I'm excited. Uh, okay. When from... do we get these surprises? Uh, well, I, I don't want to push us on if we have, still have things to talk about the swashbuckler, but no, we do have one more class that's still uh, that's still out there. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to push it forward, but Hero Icarus oh, did yeah. have a big question about how the swashbuckler is currently looking like it pushes out a ton of damage, especially if you can manage to get off a finisher every turn. Is doing lots of damage part of the class's identity? Yes, I think it has to be uh, okay. because they're designed to as a martial class, they they really do need to keep up with the damage output of um, of the fighter, really. Um, otherwise, uh, they, otherwise they're kind of like a rogue, but doesn't they don't have the best, and so why would you play a swashbuckler? Um, so we really want to make sure that they bring enough to them with what they do that they're not um, seen as lagging behind or secondary. Okay, great. Pablum That's a great you. question, though. Pablum for you has playtested the swashbuckler and unfortunately never entered Panache. Oh my goodness! Because of just uh, poor rolls every time he was oh trying no. to do something acrobatic. I hear you on this so much, um, and uh, be, because that is my life, I roll so terribly. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we talked about some when we were designing this class is what happens if you roll really poorly, mm -hmm. um, and and so we have some design ideas on the whiteboard about. Um, ways that you can maybe spend two actions to gain panache even without making a check. Um, so it's like it, it has a different effect on your action economy, but it's still an option for you mm. if you roll like I do. So I'm, I'm about, hearing you. I'm feeling for you. <laughs> what about a reaction called I meant to do that? I meant to do that. Uh, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing. Actually, this was brought up on the uh, a blog today on our site by Alex Agudas, he was talking about how it's tied to, or the panache is tied partially to initiative and that initiative is largely left up to GM fiat, mm -hmm. uh, at least as the rules are written in the core rule book. So uh, how do you balance those two things? Sure. So the, the way it's written, the swashbuckler is written right now is, is put together really specifically for that situation. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to actually pull up the, the literal wording so that I don't screw it up. Um, it is, uh, if, oh, wait, hmm, it got changed a little bit from our original version. See, that's why I pull it up so I don't say really stupid things on the air. Um, the, the idea being that if what you were doing would have caused you to roll that skill for initiative anyway, then you gain panache. Um, what we don't want to happen is for you to say, well, I'm a swashbuckler. Can I roll intimidation for initiative? 
um, if you haven't been doing anything to roll intimidation for initiative. Now, mm -hmm. the core rulebook has a lot of advice for GMs in how to decide what people are rolling for initiative and how to make sure that that's a fair adjudication without letting players abuse that system so that they're always rolling their top stat for initiative all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're leaning on that. It's a piece that we're going to have to see if, if it pans out or if it's something with that either you know players try to abuse or GMs um, aren't giving the players the opportunity to tap into. V, any final thoughts on the swashbuckler? Um, I really like the way that this opportune parry and repose from first edition that could really slow down gameplay because there's so many roles has been simplified into just a, a simple opportune repost reaction, um, especially the, you know, foe critically fails a strike against you. Great. You opened yourself up so bad. I get a free hit. I love it. Right. That right. Sounds like a uh, lot of fun. It's a thing we try to do a lot of in second edition is cut down on the number of dice rolls at the table. Mm -hmm. We want to keep the gameplay moving. It's uh, sure. you know, a, a core principle of the design that we wanted. So um, that's that, that was driving this change, and you'll see it in a lot of the other changes too. Yeah, so, so huge kudos on that. This seems like a really slimmed down swashbuckler. I freaking love the swashbuckler. I love dexterity-based classes. As soon as you throw one of those at me, I'm just 100% I'm on board. <laughs> and so I, I really like how streamlined and smooth this looks like it'll play. I'm, I'm actually going to play one in the playtest coming up. Uh, awesome. going to be playing a gymnast, and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to giving it a shot. Awesome. I hope you swing off of lots of chandeliers. Oh, so many. I'm going to be bouncing <laughs> Bring off your walls own and everything. Bring my own chandelier. <laughs> Uh, let's see. That's mm -hmm. right. <laughs> <laughs> Portable chandelier. Mm, <laughs> items. <laughs> you put an immovable rod under it, and there you go. You can swing from wherever. <laughs> I was thinking just a grappling hook, but hey, that's an even better idea. I, grappling hook actually was my number one idea because you were talking about fighting unarmed, and I thought, what if I just had a grappling hook and the rope, and then I used unarmed strikes for everything, but I still had the grappling hook to get up somewhere and like zip yeah, around and the room around and stuff. the battlefield. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I love it. I want to see how it works. All right, cool. I think it'll work like '60s animated Spider-Man, where it's like, where are? What is he webbing to? <laughs> <laughs> just the sky? Details, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's the plan. Awesome. Brings us to the witch, the last of the four classes. This was the one that I think everyone was expecting to make the APG cut, especially because from early on, we heard it almost made the core rulebook cut. Right. The witch has been an incredibly popular class throughout first edition. Um, it is a beloved class. Um, the iconic for the witch is beloved. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of love for this class. Um, I have a lot of love for it because this was the first one I got to work on as a designer. Um, so this is, uh, you know, this is, it's, there's, there's interesting things going on here. Um, like, like a lot of the other classes that we have um, been bringing forward into second edition, the witch um, had kind of an open question of what is this class actually doing in the second edition universe? So in, in first edition, um, the witch was a prepared and technically arcane spellcaster. What did that mean in first edition? It meant that they weren't a divine spellcaster, which meant... Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> um, so what is that? But we've got the wizard as an arcane prepared spellcaster. So what does this look like for the witch in this new paradigm that we're working within? And one of the first things that, that um, you know, came right away is that the witch is, you know, is a spellcaster, that the witch has a familiar, um, and that the witch works through this patron, um, that there's a sort of patron-witch relationship going on. Um, and so that's what we built the class out around. Mm -hmm. um, we toyed a lot with the idea of what tradition was the witch going to be. Should the witch be an occult-only spellcaster? Um, or is this one of those classes that's going to work better being able to dabble in different traditions? And we came down to the, the agreement that it should dabble in some different traditions. Um, but unlike the Sorcerer, which has options granting it access to all four spell lists, the Witch um, specifically does not have the Divine Spell list. Um, the Witch cat does have access to a few Divine Spells through specific patron lessons. Okay. Um, but by and large, once uh, the, the options available to the Witch are going to be focused around Arcane, um, Occult, and Primal. And our thought for that is sort of like, uh, it comes back to this idea of the witch working with a patron, that the, the, the patron is some entity that is granting the witch their power by the vehicle of this familiar. And the uh, and, and so this, the power that it's getting um, is sort of subject to this relationship. Now, if you have an entity giving power to a spellcaster and it's giving you straight divine power, that's a cleric. 
we have a class for that. That's how that gotcha. works. That, that relationship is established in the world. Um, you know, there, there are understood um, channels for how this works. Um, and the witch is doing something different. Okay. Um, and so the witch is pulling from mm. some unknown entity. Maybe it is a divine entity. There's nothing that says that it can't. But that divine entity is saying, I'm, even if I'm divine, I'm not working with you in this established divine way. We're going, we're going under the table. We're going, you know, <laughs> we're going behind everybody else's backs. Why? Up to you and your GM. Who knows? Could be anything. Could be awesome. Uh, could be terrible. Um, and it opens up a lot of storytelling opportunities. Sure. Uh, so as a witch, you're going to choose um, your first lesson. Um, all, of your, all of your witch abilities come through the form of lessons. Um, your first lesson determines your spellcasting tradition. Um, so that's where you'll pick the spell list that you pull most of your spells from. Um, and it's going to grant you some extra spells. Um, as you gain additional lessons, you're learning... Um, uh, the hexes that are the other sort of big component of the witch class. You've got these um, these hexes that you can um, in in first edition they were kind of all over the place. They were um, you know you had some that could let you um, have extra sensory abilities. You had some that could let you fly or move in unusual ways. Mm -hmm. um, you had some that would um, that you could hex other people. Um, and so one of the things we're trying to explore is like what is a hex um, and what isn't a hex. Um, that has spurred some really interesting conversations on our message boards. Um, as people sort of say, what, you know, what are these hexes good for and what are they, what are they using? Right. Yeah, I always um, thought it was odd that it's hexes in, in other lore is generally a bad thing, right? You put a hex on someone versus it's like, I'm going to use my flight hex. Wait, so right. no one can fly? Wait, how, how is this working? <laughs> right. How does this give you yeah, the or, power of flight? Or the that healing doesn't... hex. Yeah. Like you're, yeah, that, that, was, exactly. that was an odd one. Um, so we're, um, that's, that's an idea that we're sort of exploring um, is to see what, what hexes are, what's the which is relationship to hexes, mm -hmm. um, and and how that stands out. The hexes really are probably mechanically the piece that's setting the witch apart from other spellcasters. Um, in in particular, the witch and the wizard get compared a lot, um, and the wizard has the arcane school, and the witch has the hexes and the and the really beefed up. No one can have a familiar this good familiar. Um, and, and we're trying to make sure that that's going to stand um, as uh, enough flavor to the class, or if that's something that we need to, to, to up a little bit or tweak um, and see how it plays out at the table. It's, it's relatively straightforward. It's going to feel pretty familiar to a lot of players, mm -hmm. um, but that's exactly why we want the feedback, because we want to make sure that that's what we actually want. Does the cauldron feat provide you with a cauldron? Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, it, it does not, unless you want it to. Um, if you would like to have a flavor cauldron to go along with your cauldron feet, um, you can absolutely have one. Um, but we, we kind of envision it, a flavor cauldron. You know, would that it, be like a like chocolate like, cauldron or like a caramel cauldron? Maybe everything you put in it becomes chocolate flavored. Um, no, that, but, that is a feat I would take. Where's that lesson? Uh, show me. Show me what that is. <laughs> Uh, well, I'll, I'll write it for the final book for you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, but the idea is that, like, we, we, the witch speaks to a lot of these um, folklore slash social concepts of a witch. So you have the witch with the cauldron and the cackling, um, and and sort of these these ideas that we have societally around witches. Um, but we don't want you to be locked into that specifically. So the the ability, the cackle ability, um, is any auditory ability. You know, you can you could hum a merry little tune. To, to have the effects of your cackle, if that's what you wanted to do. Um, you could, and so for cauldron, you know, you're good at making these potions. Does that mean you have like a fire and a big black kettle? Like if that's what you want, yes. It could also mean that just like every morning you make really good brownies. Risky 90 says I toaster love this oven. Witch. <laughs> toaster oven, right, a toaster oven, why not? <laughs> Now, uh, the craft skill has broadened quite a bit in second edition, and so that does mean that because a witch is going to be good at toiling at a cauldron, they're also going to be good at, you know, repairing the wagon if the wheel comes off. That's right. Okay, that's that's just okay. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the skill, the, the witch is an intelligence-based class, um, and, and that's something that kind of gets overlooked a little bit in the flavor, but you're looking at someone who really goes out of their way to... Um, to, to think about things rationally, to um, really take things apart and put them back together. Um, you're, you're studying lessons. Um, mm -hmm. so, you, so the idea that you can, um, you know, take apart and put back together a spell, um, but then also be able to take it apart and put back together a wagon wheel um, becomes a little more reasonable when you think about it that way. It's, it's, it's not necessarily that you're studying books in the same way that a wizard is, but you have a good sense for how stuff works. Mm -hmm. 
I always like the idea of an intelligent witch as someone who takes a look at the cleric, like you were saying, they're the one who goes to a deity to get power. And they say, well, who can I get power from? Right? And so they're logicking right. this thing out. They don't want to sit for years studying books and doing all that stuff. They're pretty worldly, like you said, you know, craft and all that. And they're like, you know what? I bet if I could find the right entity, I could get a little bit of power myself. And I think that's really cool. Right. Right. Um, and then it, from there, it, span, it spins out and just gives you so much opportunity to build your own story. The witch, mm -hmm. um, as we've presented it in the playtest, has some of the biggest opportunities for the player and the GM to build a story together through what is your patron, what is your familiar, and what's the relationship there? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Is your patron someone that you generally have a good sense of who they are and what their motives are, and you're supporting them and working with them, and therefore your familiar is an ally and a friend and a confidant? Or is your patron you know, up to their own things. And you're familiar with this thing that's constantly trying to, uh, you know, seduce you to hell. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what story do you want to tell? It's got a huge amount of possibility there. Um, you know, and, and maybe we've thrown it too wide open. We need to bring it back a little, a little bit. We'll see. Did you just make a reference to the Golden Girls theme song about the relationship between a witch and a patron? Uh, Alan and Confidant? No, <laughs> because I am I live in a hole and I'm terribly out of touch with pop culture, but let's pretend maybe yes, if that makes me cooler. Especially 20-year-old pop culture. <laughs> <laughs> I like a couple of comments from chat. We've got uh, and and Sink do, I'll say. Hope for more cooking options for witches with a less evil option than cook people. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yep, that's something we looked at. Yeah, people Which... like to bake cookies with their spells and things in them, so... Well, mm -hmm. Rice Guy 90s response to that was uh, cookie baleful polymorph options. Hmm. 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 It seems like maybe it's it's also leading towards cannibalism. Let's then we might stay away from that. Oh, no, it's leading towards Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more like, hey, here's this cookie. Eat it. Oh, look, you turned into a squirrel. All right. Well, oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. Oh, no, that's not how I. <laughs> Oh, that's how, no, that's how I'm taking it. I like the idea that you can take your spells, even offensive ones, and like bake them into things as if you're brewing potions, right? Because exactly. you're good at crafting. Yeah, you can, yep. Well, not only are you good at crafting, um, but there's actually a feat specifically that lets you take your hexes and make them into potions, which, oh. again, can take any consumable form you want. So if you want to have hex cookies, you absolutely can. Fantastic. When it comes to the first edition wish, it felt like about half of the archetypes replaced or changed the relationship with the familiar. So I was surprised that the second edition witch just doubles down on the fact on the witch familiar relationship. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really interesting idea. Um, I mean, not interesting idea. That's an interesting observation. Um, it's it's not something we ever considered decoupling the witch from the familiar, and it is not something that I've actually gotten any pushback against. Um, I've had we've had a lot of really lively discussions about the witch, about the relationship between the patron and the witch, um, and what that looks like mechanically. Um, but I haven't actually had anyone come up and say that the that the familiars shouldn't be there or should should go away. Yeah, I really like that they're doubling down on the familiar, honestly. I, I know that the first edition archetypes took them away a lot, and I thought that robbed the the witch of one of the things that was supposed to make them special. I like to see the familiar is more forefront instead of just a living spell book that you, you know, put in a familiar pocket and hope the GM doesn't see. Uh, that all right. <laughs> so I, I do like that. I was looking through the basic lessons, and it's all you learn this, and your familiar learns this. And it really starts right. to bring it into the into the story and into your your class's repertoire. Mm -hmm. And sort of builds that relationship, whether mm -hmm. this relationship is, you know, friendly or antagonistic, sure. it, it's there. It's there. Uh, the witch was one of my wife's favorite classes. And when she heard that we were talking about it tonight, she asked uh, if the witch still cackles. And she was very happy to hear that now there's a variety of cackles. There are a variety of cackles, yes. Um, cackle has been a, a, a topic of hot debate. Um, so it's an area that we're definitely looking. So um, I know uh, some of the people who've been chatting about it are here in the audience. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and keep it up. I'm, uh, we want to make sure that this has the right feel to it. So we're, we're, we're watching that. And that's something that we really are going to um, we, we intend to address in the final version. We don't know what it's going to look like yet. Um, but the, the feedback we've been getting has been really helpful in guiding that conversation. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, from chat, uh, the Mokog says, so the witch, one of my players is concerned about how they're expected to cycle through actions in combat. Only having one or two evil eyes for combat every 10 minutes makes them really unhappy. Uh, what is the intended action cycle for longer combats or multiple short combats? Um, that's a really good question, um, and that's a piece, I think the, the answer to that is um, we need you to tell us, um, okay. because it's very possible that the witch is, um, you know, we're setting the witch up 
to use this resource mm -hmm. and then not giving them enough of it to work with. Sure. Um, and now maybe that's that we expand cackle to apply to multiple hexes. So you cast a couple of them and then keep them going for longer. Sure. Maybe it means that um, we have uh, one of the ideas that we're kicking around is um, bards have composition cantrips. Um, the idea of hex cantrips is also mm -hmm. something that we've been toying with. So um, we, we're looking at a lot of ways to do that and make sure that that class is meeting its needs and you're not getting locked out of that key feature because the combat happens to go on for more than six rounds or whatever. Right. I think one of the things that, to me, that it looked like anyway, is that in first edition, you had such a focus on the hexes. I know a lot of witch players that would focus so much on them, their spells were almost secondary, uh, and right. their, their hexes were really where they went. And this looks like it forces you to sort of balance your action economy between um, hexes for when you really needed to get something done, cackle to leave them there, uh, spells are sort of your bread and butter, just like any other spellcaster, and then your familiar mm -hmm. augments as well. And so between right. the three of those things, you can balance your action economy each turn, depending on what you want to do. Right. And that's something where, where if you're coming from Fast Night or First Edition, you might need to sort of um, rethink your relationship with your spells. Which is in First Edition had a very weird spell list. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now we're giving you a lot more options to find the spell list that's going to work right for you. But if you're not used to using those spells... Um, you know, then, then we don't want you to overlook that resource. We want you to make sure that you're, you're making the most of the abilities that are available to you. V, any last thoughts or questions on the witch? Keeping in mind that we've only got Liz for... We're, we're no, kind I want of on my surprise. I will hold all my questions. <laughs> I want my surprise. All right. We do have two broad questions that I thought are good to conclude things with. So, Liz, at what point do you want to give Vanessa her surprise? I'm going I'm to give you your surprise now. So I, I assume you have read the witch class. Uh, I have skimmed it. Have you? Okay. Um, we have put two things from Pathfinder First Edition into the Witch class okay. um, that I think you're going to enjoy. One mm -hmm. of them is the Nails ability, so that you can um, use your nails mm -hmm. as an unarmed attack. Um, the other one is the Prehensile Hair ability, which yeah. we just love the flavor of too much. Um, it's now a, a, an unarmed attack with reach um, that you can use to grapple people. So you can literally grapple people with your eyebrows. Yes, it is fantastic. <laughs> Somebody in our Discord was asking, what do you do if you don't have hair? But reading it over, you grow hair to serve yeah. the purpose. So it really... Yeah, you, you, you get hair. You know, if you don't already have it, you, you, you get it. You could cut it off again if you're, when you're done, I guess, if you really want to. But um, yeah, it doesn't require, no, no hair required. Yeah, you instantly well, grow or shrink. I pictured it receding, but you're saying that once you use the ability, you just got the mop. I'm well, sure. I mean, <laughs> it says grow or not? shrink. So I think it goes both ways. But it says hair, eyebrows, beard, or mustache. Uh, it, I love that there's nothing about gender. So you can just have uh, a full on lady just suddenly grow a beard, grapple somebody, and then it <laughs> disappears. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we wanted it to be pretty flexible um, and, and for people to have fun with. You know, why, why limit this? Mm -hmm. so the last it. two questions that I wanted to cover. Hero Icarus says, one thing they noticed is that all, all four playtest classes have some degree of interaction with the GM baked into the class. Was this by design, coincidence? What is the meaning of this? Um, so it's uh, a little bit by design, it kind of a, it started as a coincidence. And then once we realized it was happening, we decided to, that, that we just wanted to embrace it. Um, and, and so this is the advanced player's guide. Um, ideally, not exclusively, you'll have new players coming to this book, but ideally this book's intent is for people who've been playing Pathfinder for a while, um, who have uh, some familiarity with the core rulebook and the classes and the ancestries there. So they're ready to kind of take that next step. And so we think that next step is not just as a player, but also you as a player with the relationship to the GM and to the other players. Um, so in, in all of the ways that you can develop your story as a player, we want to build out the options to do that. And we want to make sure that these are still workable, um, particularly in situations like organized play, where you may not have a single GM and a long running campaign to build that story with. So what does that look like in, in these sort of um, segmented adventures? We want to make sure it still works in those environments. But we want the opportunity there for you to be able to really build something out and tell some really fantastic stories with your table. Thank you very much for joining us, Liz. This has been excellent and exciting and a lot of fun. Can you just remind people how they can interact with the playtest and how long the playtest is going on for? Oh, that's a great question. So the playtest is open now. You can go to paizo.com and one of the front page panels has a link to download the playtest document. Um, also from there, you can link to our message boards and participate in the online conversation. Um, in the playtest document itself, you'll find links to the two surveys um, that you can take uh, to give us that quantitative and qualitative feedback that we'll synthesize out to, to see where we're going. Um, 
Those are all available on paizo.com. The playtest period runs through December 2nd. Um, so, you, you know, it's only about three weeks, including mm -hmm. Thanksgiving weekend. So, um, you know, put, put some characters together, build some NPCs using these rules, um, put it through other paces and, and let us know, um, let us know how it's working at your table, what's, what you're loving, what you're not loving. Um, and, and that's going to help us make these classes as, as awesome as we possibly can be. The Advanced Players Guide itself comes out at Gen Con in 2020. Um, so it'll it'll be a little bit before it gets here. So um, get in now, get them played, get your fill, um, and then we'll we'll be back in in a couple of months with the uh, with the final versions. Excellent. Any last thing you want to shout out to bring people's attention towards? Hey, I'm just glad you're playing Pathfinder. I, no Direction's a great podcast. I appreciate you guys Aww. having me on, and uh, and it's uh, you know happy gaming everybody. Well, we appreciate you coming on. This was great. We've mm -hmm. been meaning to talk to you for a while, and so once you were added to the design team, it's like this is this is perfect. Here I am. Um, I'm glad to have had the opportunity. I'm so sorry to push everything for uh, way over the time limit, uh, but it's uh, we're talking about a lot of fun stuff. Yeah, it's a great episode. Uh, so one thing we didn't talk about before the episode is that the on-air goodbye is also the full goodbye. So oh. I'm going to say goodbye to you, and then we're going to hang up. So don't take it personally. <laughs> right. Don't try and rejoin the call to say goodbye again. That sounds great. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much. We are going to be right back for a little bit of banter right after this. Thanks, Liz. Bye, everybody. All right, let me get us back over here. I still need to fix our faces on here, so give me a moment. <laughs> and we are wacky out of the... There we go. Thanks to all this pre-setup, everyone is just off the screen in a weird way. But uh, go ahead and start. So what have you been up to lately? Uh, well, I've been thinking about my class, uh, my character that we're going to be running in the playtest that Luis is running for us. I know. Uh, so which one were you playing again? I, I can't recall. I am going to be playing a battle oracle. It is going to be a dwarf named, uh, what's his name? Osiris. Osiris, Okay. Yeah, because uh, when I was driving home, I noticed that some of the lights were out on the Toys R Us sign. Okay. And the only letters that were still lit were O S R U S. Oh, that's uh, right. And I liked it. I thought it was a cool dwarf name. So basically, I'm figuring that uh, his patron, or, uh, it's not his patron, that's a witch thing, but uh, Oracle's, their mystery, there we go. His mystery is that the one of the hammers of, that Torag used to forge the weapons of the other gods. Mm -hmm. has gained sentience and kind of become a divine being. Okay. And so I am getting powers from him. And actually, before I even read the Oracle class to know if it had a combat option, this was my concept. So I was originally hoping that the metal uh, mystery that we had in first edition, which gave you like Colossus-like powers, mm -hmm. that uh, that would be represented. It was not, but the battle one totally fills the niche that I wanted to fill in. Yeah, that is fantastic. I know I get to play the uh, the gymnast, and I am so looking forward to that. That is going to be just crazy fun. I always like to play highly mobile characters. I love to be all over the battlefield, and so that is that is my jam. Yeah, same. Actually, so uh, I was late calling dibs on the class, so my first choice was going to be the investigator because it looked really interesting. Mm -hmm. My second choice would be swashbuckler because it's that's also my jam. Like, even when I'm playing fighters, I typically don't have armor as heavy as I can afford to have based on my proficiencies mm -hmm. just because I don't want to be hampered. And even my visual is not a guy in, in big metal armor. It's somebody a little more mobile, maybe a little more superhero esque. And so the swashbuckler, especially this new interpretation of the swashbuckler is much more in line with the, the type of uh, melee combatant. I like the picture. So really the only yeah. class I didn't want to play was the witch just because uh, even though I wanted to play a witch at one point in first edition and even bought a miniature mm -hmm. before getting a little uh, gun shy about it and choosing a different character at the last minute for a campaign. I think that was for Carrion Crown that we were playing. Um, yeah, it's just a little too castery for me. Whereas mm -hmm. the fact that the Oracle has the battle Oracle option means that I can actually test how uh, some multi ability score dependency is going to work. I'm choosing a class with a charisma penalty Sorry, a ancestry with a charisma penalty for a class where the key ability is charisma. Oh, actually, uh, remind me. Does second edition have the thing that first edition had where you need like 10 minus your key ability score to cast that level spell? Like if I wanted to cast ninth level spells, I needed a 19. No, I don't oh. think they do, but it will affect okay. your DCs and your attack rolls. So yeah. 
If you're a sorcerer, for example, you use charisma for everything. That affects your spell attack rolls. You attack with charisma. You can't just get by on decks. So that will make your spells weaker, whether they're an attack spell or a DC spell. That's fine, because I wasn't really looking at too many DC spells. Although an attack spell... Well, actually, my... If I am a battle sorcerer, my revelation spell is, uh, what is it? Something lance, divine lance, mm. something like that. Like holy lance? Yeah, divine lance. Divine lance right? it's, it's basically just a, a, a blast spell with a weapon yeah. uh, theme to it. That's mm-hmm. the only time that I might actually need a high enough charisma, uh, right. yeah, charisma to pull off using it. But really, the only reason I would use it is one, if I'm in a situation where I really need a ranged weapon mm-hmm. and I just. I don't plan on getting a ranged weapon, especially okay. because I've got this option. And the other thing is, if I really want to try and max out my curse line and get to that uh, yeah. knocking myself out for eight hours, mm-hmm. I would have to use four uses of Divine Lance in the same combat. Yeah, I, I remember hearing that the, the four hour thing just seemed really tough to oh, no. me. Eight hours. Or eight hours. I'm sorry. Eight hours seemed really tough. It was just like, yeah, that better be the last attack on the last boss of the book. You know you're going home after this because otherwise you're, you know, you're finished. I thought that was a little extreme, but it'll be interesting to Wait. see how that plays. Crazy Stitch in chat is saying Divine Lance doesn't advance your curse. Wait, so what do I do to advance my curse? Hmm. Uh, revelation spells only. So the focus set, isn't that? Oh, no, that's my granted cantrip. Oh, oh, my revelation domain are might or zeal and call to, oh, call to arms. Oh, I'm not going to be calling to arms four times in the same combat. <laughs> All right. So uh, I haven't completed making this character, so mm-hmm. I am going to have to pay close attention to my two related domains and what my options are there and see if there's anything that I actually do want to. Well, it's something that it looks spammable to me. If you haven't uh, finished, I haven't even started. I know I want to do, I think, a halfling or a gnome, probably a halfling swashbuckler. And I'm going to see if I can do an unarmed halfling swashbuckler that does the gymnast. I want this crazy little halfling that runs around, bouncing off walls and kicking people in the face. That's what I want to do. You will be Luis's favorite ever if you make him a luchador. (laughs) I might have to do some research so I don't do anything culturally inappropriate. But maybe. I don't know. I just... I like the idea that (laughs) maybe I might do that. Although it would be more fun as a surprise unless Luis happens to be tuned in today. I haven't seen him in chat. (laughs) Luis is 100% going to hear this episode. I mean, before we play, though, maybe he's busy. (laughs) We're playing in like two. Anyway. I know. I'm just saying. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it'll be a lot of fun. I will consider the luchador. Uh, And yeah, I just think it's going to be great. Um, I really am excited about this book. As excited as I was for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, I am more excited for this book, and I'm more excited to play it. So, I am curious what the landscape is going to look like when the classes are these 18. So the 12 from the core rulebook plus these four. Mm-hmm. How is this going to, like, how many options will you have for tanky classes? How many options will you have for mm-hmm. divine classes? It does feel like the four classes that were included here is one per pillar of the typical party. Right, you can make a full and complete party of these four. Uh, before Param kicks my butt for not saying this, uh, I did write on the APG book, but I did not write anything for any of these four classes. Okay, and nothing that's been revealed yet. And so nothing that's been about. revealed yet that I can talk about. So, But I feel like I should probably do that. <laughs> so, otherwise he will be mad at me. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, this... uh, it's not like we're reviewing the book right now, but it, it's sure. it is always worth bringing up whenever yeah. we might have a potential conflict because I didn't write on this book. I'm excited for it. Uh, it's the pressure's on, though, like the first oh, yeah. APG changed the game more than I think anyone expected it to. Mm-hmm. And now people expect this to change the game. Oh, yeah. Whereas I think some of the um, the the world guide the the lost omens campaign setting books mm-hmm. are the ones that are changing the game in ways people weren't expecting like a lot of the right. faction half of the character guide had some really interesting interpretations of uh, of archetype feats mm-hmm. yeah i like how the new archetypes are shaking out that we've seen so far uh, it really opens a ton of fantastic design space where you're like you know what would be cool a class that does this Oh, but that's not 20 levels worth of content. That's like six or eight levels worth of content. Great making an archetype. If you have something that's even eh, 12 levels of content, it's almost a class, but maybe like not good on the high levels. Again, make it just a big archetype with a lot of options. And because of this new design space, I can think of so many things that would be so great. So that's, that's going to be amazing in customizing characters to be the way you want them. 
Yeah, something else about classes in second edition is it seems there's a lot more formula to it. Like every class mm. in the core rulebook had between 11 and 13 pages. Most of them had 11. Like it was really a set page count. And that's not something we got in first edition. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of concepts that you'll see for like, is this a class or is this worthy of being a class in mm -hmm. second edition is basically, can it fill exactly 11 pages? Right. If it's more than that, then maybe you need to rethink it. Maybe it's too broad. If it's less mm -hmm. than that, Look at an archetype. Because yeah. like Liz was saying, like when the APG was announced, we heard there were 60 archetypes. And then it was like, well, no, no, there's 60 pages of archetypes. Mm -hmm. And at Gen Con, no one knew the exact number of archetypes. But she said in the interview just now, 40 archetypes taken up 60 yeah. pages, which okay. just shows that there's more flexibility in the uh, option allowance for an archetype mm -hmm. than there is for a class. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also just like how... Like, this is what Lauren says, uh, the network's own Lauren Sieg. She loves that, and, and I do too, that it's so much easier to get your concept across in just like a couple levels, like two or levels typically. Uh, if you're like, I want to play the fighter mage, well, that's one class and what a dedication feat and you're done. At second level, you've got your, your character concept down. Whereas in first edition, it might take like, oh, my build really opens up at fifth level. It finally gets to do what it wanted to do at seventh level. It's like, no, no, you can do it from the beginning. And I think more archetypes going in there just give you more story ideas that you say, yes, now I can make this character. I take first level class. I open this archetype up at second. Boom, I'm where I want to be. How long do you think it's going to be before we get a whole new class? Oh, Something like a never just Basin? ported over from first edition. That's tough. I mean, third party publishers are already doing it, so there's that. But, um, but yeah, that is from from Paizo. I think yeah. they're going to surprise us. I would want to say three, four years at least. Like it's going to take a while. But knowing the design team and how they really like to just like get on a subject and go, oh, this is too good to pass up. I think it'll be before that. So probably I'm going to I'm going to say two years. What are some of the classes you think we're going to get in the near future? Uh, I know a lot of folks are talking about things like Gunslinger. Um, I know people are mixed about it, but there's a lot of people who are like we need a Gunslinger. Uh, some of the psychic classes I think we're missing, just even the basic psychic uh, folks in chat are actually talking about it. I think some of those bread and butter ones, um, even Liz said they're really excited about a summoner. It just wasn't right for this book. I think we're going to see a summoner coming out. But I think things like a summoner, for example, just need a lot of support. And I think that they're going to have enough things out there in a couple of years or something to be able to support a summoner, right? You're going to have enough, uh, like I would build it on as like an animal companion with familiar traits or something. Uh, but you're going to have enough of those extra abilities published in different world guides, for example, that you can say, okay, this will support, you know, back support it. And then we can create some core abilities now. And then you've got lots of options, but what do you think? Well, uh, I was just going to quote chat here. Icarus says that the, oh, I'm happy that Gunslinger will be archetypes. Has that been confirmed? I don't know. That oh, there we go. Event. Yeah. Earlier, they, they made the comment that the Gunslinger will probably be an archetype. Whole class locked into one weapon type isn't what they're going for in second edition. I don't know. I can see like a ranged combatant being a full class, like Archer, and mm -hmm. then Gunslinger being a subtype, a subclass uh, of a the path. Archer. Right. A path. Yep. A right. path. A life choice. Yeah, you know what? That, that actually would be a pretty good way to do it because you can have you could do an uh, an archery like a bow base archer, a crossbow base, and a, and a gunslinger base, and a thrower. And a thrower. Oh, they need more throwing options. Let me just let me just say that if I want to play like a bullseye type character, it is a little tough right now. Uh, rogue is probably as close as you're going to get, but there's not a lot of specialization things for it. Um, so I'd like to see more of that. But um, yeah, that'd be cool. Oh, and the Macog in chat is saying a couple of summoner types. Uh, you've got Spirit Summoner, Demon Summoner, Diabolist. Mm -hmm. And also, like, I think you were talking about ways that you can make the Eidolon. But mm -hmm. I think you could also have an Eidolon list summoner and just go with you're the guy that spams the battlefield with a variety of low threat but very specific monsters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And... There were archetypes that did that before, but I would love to see a summoner that really did have, like, I focus on Eidolons and, like, I have a pet with me. I have, like, maybe a minor pet, like a familiar, uh, and, and focus more on spell work that is summoning or conjuring adjacent. And then one that is just, like, I summon the monsters. You want monsters? 
I summon monsters. One thing that, oh, was I talking to Luis? Maybe it was when we had Luis and Eleanor on the podcast when they were talking about why the Lechi was in the, which one was it in? If we had so many books in such oh. rapid succession. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and Luis was also just talking about how he, he gets frustrated when I can't remember the names of products. Anyway, we got the Leshy recently. Yeah, right away. And it was in the World Guide. It must have been the World Guide, right? It was in the World Guide, yeah. I think it was in the so, very first one. Or second one, maybe. In, in chat. Uh, uh, Lost Elturo. Omen Character Guide. So it was the second World oh. Guide, which is the Character Guide. That's right, because the character guide had a whole yeah. bunch of ancestries. If only there was something in the title that gave that away. Um, so yeah, one of the reasons that that uh, ancestry made the cut is because it was introduced so late in first edition, mm. but had so much traction immediately. I wonder if the shifter is a class that we're going to get sooner rather than some of the other classes. Not just because it's a pretty broad, cate- uh, a pretty broad concept, mm-hmm. but also because it never really got its moment to shine. Yeah, that's true. We didn't hear a lot about it. Honestly, the shifter... We heard a lot of complaints about it. Well, we heard that. See, the shifter, again, is one that, I don't know, can they make a whole class out of it? There's a lot of cool things you could do, though. So maybe. Um, But it could also be an archetype. I can imagine enough class feats, each one centered around different animals, and so you could take a single path where you were just the one animal shifter, you always turn into that one thing, and all those feats represent different ways you embody that one animal. Oh, I see. Or you can be the zoo shifter uh, where <laughs> you take the variety of them. So that's, you know, right now I need a bear's maw, but I also need giant eagle wings. Mm-hmm. And so you become the, the hybrid shifter. Yeah. Sometimes I need a beaver tail. You never know. Oh, man. Yeah. If you want to just lay down in the dam for the night. Mm-hmm. And you just slap stuff around with that big old tail. You got it. Yeah, but you got to get the trees down. I guess you can have an axe, so you don't need to also form the teeth. But you might need the teeth. <laughs> you might need the teeth if you're a shifter. And yeah, okay, whatever I it guess is I that filters the splinters out of your mouth. Yeah, I guess you could have 11 pages of silly animal abilities. I'd probably, I'd probably work. Okay. <laughs> uh, interesting. Crazy Stitch says they expect the Stitcher to be an archetype. And McCog says they think they would work better as an ancestry. I'm still thinking of it as it deserves to be its own class. It can fill those 11 pages. Yeah, they had, I'm trying to think of the name right, right now. There was in first edition, there was a, a race that focused around like lycanthropic ancestry. You know, like you're not a werewolf, but your ancestors were. And I'm, I, I'm blanking on the name of that. If was Chat this wants first party? So probably uh, from the advanced uh, race guide? Uh, it was, but I think it was in one of the splat books, actually. So, oh, okay. one of the player's guides. I can't recall, though. I have one of these characters, and I remember I didn't like it because I built it really badly. Um, <laughs> and I kind of forgot about it completely. It was my one shot at trying to make a ranger I enjoyed, and it failed, so. I rarely played outside of what? the core rulebook races for first edition, so unfortunately, uh, it- I don't even know which one you're talking about. Hansik do saved me. It's where touched, I guess. That does not even sound familiar. It doesn't, but I don't know. Skinwalker. Yes, Bard wannabe. Skinwalker. Oh, Skinwalker that was it. does sound familiar. Yes, that is the save. Uh, yeah, so the Skinwalker, I could definitely see as being similar to the Asimar as one of those uh, ancestry options that's available for anyone. So that way you can have a halfling Skinwalker or, half or, or a human Skinwalker. I guess we didn't have half work. But I could see something like that happen. So what are, uh, what's your local gaming like now? I know you recently moved. I'm so embarrassed. I don't know. I recently moved. I recently moved, but when uh, our move like took me six weeks, it was crazy. And during that move, like when I got here, I already had on my plate, I want to say 50,000 words worth of assignments to do. And so I have nonstop just been writing, although I know that it is a really good, like upstate New York has a ton of gaming opportunity. I'm on their Warhorn. There's stuff all the time. I just haven't gotten a chance to go to it. And it's embarrassing. Um, I have met a few folks up here that do game, been invited to a couple things, had to turn them down because as I said, I'm just a, I'm a slave to that keyboard right now. But once I get all that stuff turned in, probably lots and lots of society. That's good. Like, don't feel bad. I believe at this point I have reviewed more Pathfinder 2nd Edition books than I've played Pathfinder 2nd Edition sessions. Oh my goodness. Well, just my local games have all turned... Uh, so I'm playing Adventurous, mm-hmm. which is still a 1st Edition game. We've 
touched on the idea of maybe converting to second edition, continuing to play War for the Crown, but mm-hmm. two obstacles there is that uh, Crystal, our GM, has very little uh, second edition experience, mm. and Kathy is a dyscalculus, okay. and so one obstacle that she has in second edition she didn't have in first is that the exact result is a lot more important because if it's mm. 10 over your result, it's a critical success. Mm-hmm. 10 below, it's critical failure. So before, if she rolled a 14 one round and succeeded, and then the next round did the same thing, rolled a 16, she didn't have to figure out the math. She just had to know it's still a success. Mm-hmm. But now because there's a gradient of success and failure, sure. it's more important that you do the result every time, which Hero Lab helps her do because Hero Lab is not just a character builder, it's character manager. Mm-hmm. And it's got dice uh, roller in, integrated and everything. Exactly. And so she hasn't found the second edition equivalent of the first edition hero lab. Cause she's not crazy about the second edition hero lab. Mm. And so uh, playing second edition is really like literally when I was reading over the first, uh, sorry, the second edition core rule book, mm-hmm. I was like, this is not the game for Kathy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're playing online, you can set up a lot of macros for your abilities. So if you're playing like over roll 20, uh, I set up macros for like 90% of what my character does. That way I don't have to worry about it. I just click on my character, click the button that says like melee, and it gives me a melee roll. It'll even pop up little windows that say, is there a modifier? <laughs> it defaults to zero. So if there's not, I just enter, enter, and I'm done. And if there is, I'm like, oh yes, the bard's giving me a plus one to hit. Boop, done. And it'll send it right on in. So... I actually like, so that's not a good solution for Kathy for very Kathy specific things. One is that her computer isn't even strong enough to support her playing oh, no. online. She comes okay. to my house. And uh-huh. so we're both on the same computer mm. that's also running our connection, running Roll20, running gotcha. everything. So we okay. couldn't dedicate that much time to it. Plus, she wouldn't be able to do it at home. Okay. But for a someone that's not specifically Kathy, but has a couple of Kathy's issues. <laughs> Kathy doesn't mind us going deep into her issues in this uh, episode, but um, yeah, using Roll20 as a character manager is a really interesting solution. All right. You give me an idea. Uh, oh. What oh. technology does she have access to? Oh boy. She has her iPad. iPad. Okay. And she has some kind of computer. Well, because what I'm thinking, here's what I'm thinking. Uh, in Excel, for example, you can do macros and things. I'm thinking about setting up like an Excel spreadsheet if she had that. I think you can open it on an iPad. I'll have to check. But a way to basically just have your character sheet in there in Excel so you can update it there. It updates the values for you. But then for the major roles that you're going to do, just a little button that re-randomizes, runs a macro, and gives you a number. And that way she doesn't have to deal it. She just clicks, boom, she's got a number, done. So what I especially like about this is that she would probably need Path Builder because uh, mm-hmm. she's not going to be using Second Edition Hero Lab. Right. And Path Builder, you can't work uh, on an Apple device. Actually, uh, the Macog just mentioned this in chat. But Param is working on a video with a workaround so that you can use a, a PC simulator mm-hmm. to uh, use Path Builder on uh, non-Android devices. So I, I just like the amount of hoops that are potentially able to be set up for Kathy to jump through that as long as other people are the ones setting this up for her, we could get Kathy to play Kathy to play second edition. I think so. I think this is going to have to be a network goal to get Kathy second edition of playable. All right. So before we commit to converting war for the crown to second edition, first we will solve the Kathy issue. Okay. <laughs> But I like it. I like that Fantastic. this team is really coming together for Kathy's benefit. Yeah. Um, you were asking about playing. One thing I just did want to sort of shout out to, uh, most of my second edition playtime, like the vast majority of it, has been on Roll for Combat, uh, actual play podcast, The Fall of Plague Stone. So I get to play on there with Lauren um, and a couple other folks. And uh, so those are the two No Direction Network members that are on there. And that has just been wonderful because we play most weeks for like two to three hours. And that has really been like, I guess, keeping my gaming energy alive, you know, so I'm not just buried under, you know, writing stress and all that. And it's, it's been really, really wonderful. And I'm playing a spellcaster on that one, which is pretty funny because for me, like, I know you like to play marshals. For me, yeah, playing marshals is my go-to. I want to learn a system because it's typically like a little simpler. 
You know, I, I don't have to remember what my 18 spells do. Uh, but for long running games like this, I really like spellcasters because then you can really figure out all the ins and outs of the different, you know, of the different spells and mechanics. So it's pretty cool. Macog wants to know how you are liking Plaguestone. Um, I really like it. It's a it's a Jason Bowman adventure, which means it is really difficult. But we're also learning that that might just also be second edition. Uh, a lot of the second edition math is so tight that when you have a solo encounter against something that has three levels on you, you better be on top of your game. Uh, we've also learned things like don't don't hoard your consumables in a lot of role-playing games. I'm one of those types of players that likes to just go, oh, I've got a stack of potions. I'm going to save them in case I need them. But then, of course, I die because I didn't use them. Uh, this is... You don't do that. In second edition, get your consumables on the hard fights. You use them, and you will do so much better. Uh, but also take every single combat as if you are probably going to die this combat. Uh, you, you should see the gold piles. Like... Any, look over any of my Pathfinder Society characters and just look at how much gold I have not spent. And that is because I am such a hoarder when it comes to that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm that way in society because, like, usually with society games, they're four or five hours. Oftentimes, if I'm sitting at the table, I'm contributing to enough shenanigans, whether as the GM or as a player, it's going to run closer to five hours. So that by the time it's done, like everyone's just packing their stuff up and going. And then I get to the next one and I unpack my stuff exactly as I left it before. And I'm like, oh, I didn't spend that gold. Well, I guess I'm carrying it over. And all of a sudden it's, you know, four weeks or something. And I go back in and there's just a mountain of gold. And I'm like, well, I've got 10 <laughs> minutes before the game starts. What can I buy with 38,000 gold pieces? Anyone have any great ideas? Uh, one of the only exceptions for characters with a lot of gold for me is Stone Throw because mm -hmm. Stone Throw has, uh, he's my dwarf with um, Mad Dog Barbarian Dwarf. Mm -hmm. So he's got an animal companion and I went with Joey, the kangaroo. Yes. And basically anything I get Stone Throw uh, defense wise, Joey gets the same thing. Okay. And so that depletes my gold pretty quickly. But at least I've got a, like a kangaroo in full plate running around. Mm -hmm. Chicken butt. Smart Goblin says airship, what I can buy with my mountain of gold. And I have done this. <laughs> I have done this. Although that was planned. Um, but yeah, I have a, a silly Pathfinder character, a first edition society character, still legal to play, hasn't leveled out yet, that owns an airship. Uh, and sprung it. And not it. much else from what I understand. I have, yeah, I have a couple like really basic items. I have a stone of good luck because uh, I got some of the luck feats for humans. So his luck is insane. And I have the airship and that's it. But he's a kineticist, so he's good without equipment. It's fine. And uh, sprung this on a GM at Gen Con one year for the special. And that was the most marvelous thing I think ever. Well, you also had a massive airship miniature, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I built it. Uh, I built it out of several layers of foam. I cut it up and I put it together. And uh, I, I, I had it off to the side. So if you're playing in the Sagamore, there's a bunch of tables. But even during the specials, there's several that are not used. And so there was a nearby table that was not used. And I just put my box over there. And when it came time to reveal the airship, I went over and grabbed this thing out of there. And there's this big honking airship miniature uh, that has room for like people to stand on top and a grid on top of the miniature, everything just ready to go uh, that elevates itself off the table. It was, it was so much fun. Did the GM love you or hate you for it? Oh, both. Uh, it was oh, Nathan, good. Yeah, it was Nathan King, who was a friend of ours, and he had no idea. Most of the table had no idea. The only thing I had warned them about was, hey, have a way to fly, because I wanted to make sure they could fly on and off the airship if they needed to. Uh, and otherwise, I just, yeah, Smart Goblin was there. That's how he knows about it. And yeah, I just told him that. And then it was a surprise to everyone. It was fantastic. It was just so great. He spent the entire middle portion of the special, because it was in three acts, it was Solstice Scar. He spent the entire middle portion not knowing what to do. He's like, <laughs> these guys have almost no range. You win that fight. Success. Next one. Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, some animal companions and some barbarians. Success. I don't know what to do with this. It finally took John. Throw the animal companion at the ship. Yeah, I mean, he's just got all these things. Finally, in the third act, we're going against undead, and most of them can fly. And so, okay, now we're having this, like, aerial battle where the ghosts are flying up to the airship, and we're fighting them off. And, okay, it kind of got cool. 
Well, during all this, John Compton had heard about what the shenanigans were and decided to come over and see what was going on. And he wrote a custom monster for us to fight as the BBEG at the end of that special uh, instead of what was normally on there. And it was terrifying. (laughs) It was it was frightening. So if you want to read that story, I've got a blog post about it uh, under story time on the on the website. So, yeah, it is a classic. It's. It's been brought up on podcasts that you're not on. Like, it's, it's become legend. What? Which podcasts? I want to listen to this. Well, this one. One time we had uh, John one. Compton and Adam Daigle on. <laughs> I'm sure other people out there are talking about, like, I was at PaizoCon one time, and the next table had an airship, and yeah. they were just flying over everything, and the guy in charge of Pathfinder Society came over to try and shoot the ship down. It was... <laughs> I got, I wanted to be at that table. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was pretty insane. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've only been a part of uh, two gaming legends. It was that one, and when we played, what was it four different Paizo products at one time, or three? What? I guess. Yeah, uh, Jen Mateague run ran this game. It was an April Fool's game she wrote uh, about Paizo Unchained, where you go into the Paizo offices. Uh, and fight in their office space and even fight some of their uh, employees. And (laughs) she intended it to be like a level seven Pathfinder first edition game. And then we had people that were like, well, I only have a Starfinder character. And it's like, sure, bring them. And someone else like, well, I only play adventure card game. It's like, just play that. It's fine. We'll figure it out. And um, I was, it was almost four because I had a Pathfinder 2nd Edition playtest character I was going to play. And I was this close to playing her. And I really wished I had because we would have run four different systems at once. But Jen was just like taking it all. It was great. Uh, so you were talking about Fall of Plague Stone and how it's deadly. I've been mm-hmm. listening. I just listened to the latest episode they released. Uh, I listened to it on the drive home today. I mm-hmm. think maybe it was the drive in. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I listened to it today. And right. someone remarked that, thank goodness you had a paladin with um, the spam- spammable lay on hands. Oh, yeah. Right now in chat, people are talking about different party composition. Uh, just based on the deadliness of second edition, what are some of the best healing options? And like, what is the most important character to have in your party? Um, most like single most important character. I think that you want you definitely need a frontliner because I play a spellcaster and they're squishy in two ways. Their armor class is terrible and their hit points are terrible. And, and even just they're like, they look on paper, they're marginally terrible. Like they're a little lower, (laughs) but I look at the barbarians, 50 something hit points and my 32 hit points. And it's like, that's a big, that's a big spread. And then I look at the, the armor classes and go, well, the tankiest character in our group has an AC of like 20, I think with shield raised 21, maybe my armor class is sitting at like 16 or 17. And that's like, Oh, that's only a few points. Except that because of how the crit system works with that net 10, I am so easy to crit. And if I get crit, I will get one shot. And so for that, I'd say you definitely need solid front line, solid like group control. You don't want to get mobbed. You want to stay away from things. Uh, but you need someone to stand up there and take those punches because otherwise it will be a TPK. Like this is going to be really tough to do for white mages or whatever in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. So... Okay, so you think a tank is more important than a healer just because everyone has access to medicine? Is that the yes, idea? Yes, I think so. Because between medicine, spammable lay on hands, like medicine, there's ways to sort of make it spammable. Like there's a lot of healing options out there. Most of the ones that I've seen that are that are pretty decent are between battle. Like we're going to spend 10 minutes and do this thing um, or, you know, however long. But I think that, yeah, you know, like you can get potions, they're not too expensive. But yeah, I, th- I think that having a frontliner is more important than a healer because you're going to be able to make up for those those heals in other ways. Uh, in combat, healing is potent. So like my character is a healer. I don't have a good spammable in between combat heals. I am a combat healer. I only have a few spells per day and they will heal you from, oh my gosh, I'm almost going to die to, hey, I'm at max hit points. Uh, but I've only got a handful. So. All right. So... Uh... As the swashbuckler in our playtest game that's coming up, are you our tank? Oh yeah, I'm gonna go full tanky as much as I can. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's a second swashbuckler in that group. Let uh, me see if I can find the composition. Yeah, I, I can't remember who's playing it, but I remember that they're gonna play the braggart. So they're gonna stand yes. there and tell us all how awesome they are, while my character bounces off walls and zips around the battlefield. 
It's Dustin. He's going to be playing Dustin. the braggart. Yeah. Alex mm -hmm. is playing the investigator. Param is playing the witch. And I am playing the oracle. Fantastic. So I think that'll be a good, I think that'll be a good group because we've got two frontliners. You know, if you take a heal spell, we have some in combat healing. Um, I'm sure somebody will have medicine. So I think it'll be good. I might take medicine. I haven't decided yet, but I am also going to be a frontliner because I plan on just waging forward with my hammer and uh, proving mm -hmm. what the Forge of Torag can handle. Yeah. I'm actually going to load up a Path Builder right now to see if they've got the playtest characters in here. Okay. Does not seem like it. I don't think I mentioned this on the show with Param, but I actually I, I bought Path Builder because there's the free to play or oh. free to use version, and then there's a paid option that's like six bucks. Mm -hmm. I've been using it since second edition came out pretty regularly, so yeah. I just thought, yeah, this is a, a tool that I get enough out of, and mm -hmm. the added features of uh, having it. Um, the paid version lets you export in a lot of different ways. Oh, okay, cool. So that's definitely been worth it. Yeah, I'm a big fan of, hey, if you're using the software, pay for it, like if you can. Uh, and especially a lot of apps like that that are only a few dollars, it's worth it. Uh, so I'm actually looking forward to Param's walkthrough on using Path Builder on a PC. Because most of my character building is here at my desk. Uh, you know, doing things where I have multiple windows and can look stuff up on the internet and different PDFs because I don't I don't really own a lot of hardback books. I do everything digital, so I like to have it all in front of me here um, with my character creator. Uh, so right now, all my second edition characters, like the one I'm playing for Plague Stone and a few others, they're not in Hero Lab. They're on an Excel spreadsheet that does all the all the formulas. Uh, and having Path Builder would be fantastic, but I I need it here. This this isn't going to do it for me. Yeah, funny enough, I have not made a character on a physical character sheet yet for second edition because of Path Builder. I've just mm. just gone digital every time. So at first when there was all the complaints about the core rulebook character sheet and mm -hmm. people were coming up with alternatives and Param ended up with the form fillable one that ended up being one of the most popular options. Yeah, I still one. haven't used it because I've got Path Builder. But I guess now I will finally have to use it to get this uh, Oracle off the ground. See, I like paper character sheets, but I haven't played in person yet because I haven't had a chance to engage my local uh, society lodges. But that's my plan. Like my plan is to basically use something like Path Builder or something like that to do the math for me and help me make decisions and make sure I didn't forget anything. And then move that all onto like a form fillable uh, PDF character sheet and print that out. And then because I like to write in the margins and, and everything and you can't really you can't do that on a tablet. If you write on it like it just smudges off or it, it, it's on there forever. It's no good. All right, I think we're about ready to wrap things up. Sounds good to me. All right. Have you got the uh, wrap-ups and shout-outs oh. music queued up? You know, when you, when you jump in on me. It's too popular not to do. Wrap -ups if you don't, I can sing it live. Wrap -ups there we go. It's playing. And All right. Wrap-ups. Wrap-ups. And shout -ups. All right. Wrap-ups and shout-outs. Thank you for joining us for episode 212 of No Direction, the No Direction Network's Pathfinder News Reviews and Interviews podcast. Before we go, we want to bring attention to some cool things that are going on in the gaming world. And actually, also, I want to thank Liz Liddell once again for coming on because uh, she was an awesome guest. Mm -hmm. And I thought we had a really fun conversation about the Advanced Players Guide. Yeah, uh, that was fantastic. Um, there was some really great insights into sort of the headspace of the design team, why they did certain things the way that they did them. And I think that sort of thing is, you know, for me as someone who also writes for the game as well as plays it is invaluable because then I can go into it going, ah, this is that way for a reason. They wanted to do this for this reason and it's working or it's not. And so even as a play test, it seems really useful so you can you can see what they were going for and then give them feedback on whether or not they hit the mark. A couple of things I want to bring people's attention to. We've got Owen Casey Stevens has launched the 52 and 52 pre-order and bonus mega bundle. This is going to take some explaining. 52 and 52 goes back to his days of Super Genius and Rogue Genius games when he was releasing a new product a week. At the time, it was a new Pathfinder first edition product because that was, you know, that was the game in town. Mm -hmm. He is returning to that and he is raising the stakes. He is going to be releasing 52 products, each of which is 
compatible with first edition, second edition, Starfinder, and fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. I don't so, know. and and like I don't know how I don't know how he's I've doing double this. checked this a few times just to make sure that I understood it right. Yes, it's not that in the fifty-two, some of them will be first edition, some will be second edition. No, no, every no, single it's one. Every of them. single one. All four of those systems are supported. And from the sound of it, it looks like you're going to get a product and it's going to be like, here's the product and here's it for all the systems. So even if you're like, well, I don't play fifth edition, if you later decide, all right, I'll give it a crack, you already have all these rules. And rules you're already somewhat familiar with if you had played with it in one of the other, the many other systems that it supports. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like, I, I can totally understand. Like, I'm going to do a once per like week release schedule because he's amazing and if you're doing like a smaller PDF thing that's like, well, this is, you know, two to five pages or something of, of, of material. Okay, great. Like, like we we're talking about archetypes being super cool. I could see like being like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do an archetype a week for a year. Okay, sure. But to say, I'm going to do something that's like the, you know, the basket weaver archetype, except it's going to work for first edition, second edition, Starfinder, fifth edition. I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know how you're going to take, even just with theme. This is insane to me. Insane. Well, it's also like, okay, so it's compatible with first edition, second edition, and fifth edition Dungeons & Dragons. That all makes sense, at least in that they're all fantasy games. Sure. He's also throwing in Starfinder, a sci-fi game. I mean, that... it's, it's sci-fi. It's sci-fantasy, right? Still... It's it's going in a different direction and like just broadening how he has to like the the stuff that he has to find and design has to be compatible with star fantasy as well as straight up fantasy. Yeah. And that straight up fantasy has to work across three different systems. And, yeah, and it's and it's not just one element. It's not like I'm gonna write a handful of spells. Okay, I can see you doing that. But is it gonna be fifty two weeks of spells? No, it, it sounds like it's gonna be a bunch of different types of elements all across this time that still work with all of them. I don't <laughs> So on top of that, if you pre order, you mm -hmm. are gonna get a deep discount. It's gonna be a thirty dollar product instead of I believe the regular price. Oh there we go, is gonna be forty nine ninety five. So even at a regular price, you're getting your content for less than a buck a PDF. Discounted, you're getting it for almost fifty cents a PDF. And you get a bonus mega bundle of a bunch of content that he's already released. Let's see how many PDFs you get in the bonus bundle. I'm still scrolling. 513 additional PDFs are thrown in with your $30. This is, I actually, I haven't placed my order yet, but I am 100% getting in on this while it is still such an incredible deal. And there's very few people that I would have confidence in to pull this off enough to pre-order it even at this low cost owen is definitely one that i know he's going to keep up the schedule it, the quality is going to be there it's going to be interesting creative ideas uh, it's everyone that plays any of these systems should get this bundle absolutely oh my gosh i <laughs> i have no doubt he can do it that's the other thing because owen is just so tenacious and so talented and such a hard worker that you know he's going to pull it off you know, it's it's like when you go and see a daredevil do some incredible stunt, right? You're like, how in the world can anyone do that? But you know that that person is talented enough that you know they're going to succeed. Like, they have to. Otherwise, why are we all sitting here in the stadium waiting for them to, you know, ride a skateboard over a chasm? We know they can do it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. But you just got to see it. Like, I, he's going to do it, but it's it's this is insane. This is insane. <laughs> So uh, right now, I know you can get it at Open Gaming Store. If you go, actually, uh, what's the, if you, if you are friends with, uh, actually, if you follow us on Facebook, that we've included a link there. That is probably the most direct way that you can go to get it. Also, if you're friends with Owen on Facebook or any social media, he has definitely placed links out there. Or you can go to the Open Gaming Store and uh, just, you know, shop around until you find it. I have a feeling it's going to be in their, like, featured products section for a while. And if you're on our Discord, which, uh, by the way, is the most wonderful community for gaming, specifically for Pathfinder Starfinder gaming on the internet, please join our Discord. Uh, if you're on there, you'll also see links in the shoutouts section as well. If they're not there, Ryan will put them there because he has all the links. But uh, uh, Luis is in chat, by the way, and he says, that's a PDF every week for 10 years when you include the Mega Bundle. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Well, maybe we should ask him live about what we're talking about. Luis, what do you think about if I make my swashbuckler a luchador? Please let us know in chat what you think. Fantastic. 
Well, not just a luchador, a halfling unarmed luchador is going to be jumping around kicking everybody. Yes, as a swashbuckler gymnast. That's what I want to know. While we're waiting for Luis's answer, something else I want to shout out to is Arcane Mark has a Patreon. Oh, okay. Normally, I don't make a habit of bringing people's attention to other Patreons since we have our own, and every Patreon feels like competition. <laughs> but <laughs> this is uh, Mark Seifter and Linda Zayas Palmer. They've got Arcane Mark is their vlog series that they've been doing. It feels like they were doing three a week since they yeah. launched. Like They do an incredible amount mm -hmm. of content and analysis and designer talk for Pathfinder. Uh, gearing towards second edition because that's obviously what's on mark's mind lately sure. uh they had a pretty catastrophic computer malfunction mm. and so they are not able to continue without uh getting a new computer that is able to sustain their level of content output mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh editing and whatnot mm -hmm. so uh they've set up a patreon it's patreon.com slash arcane mark and you can join at a couple of levels. I actually haven't even checked what the membership levels are. I just know that the end result is getting more Arcane Mark, and that's worth it for me. Fantastic. Finally, uh, also, I'm... go ahead. <laughs> Louis says, Luchador is great. More Luchadors, please. So apparently I am making a Luchador. I will have to do some research on that. So Excellent. Great. <laughs> I am going to do a uh, a teaser for a future shout out because oh. I don't have the name of the people that produced this yet. But okay. this is something I'm super excited about. My friend picked up for me at uh, New York Comic Con. Is this that? is an HP slider. Okay. So it is a pin. You pin it to your lapel. Mm -hmm. And as your character takes damage, you just slide that heart on down mm -hmm. from green to yellow to red. Oh. I am not one who likes to declare what my current hit point total is. Mm. So I like to be descriptive. And I also like the idea that if uh, the healer looks over at me and I'm covered in blood, he should be able to tell without me describing it. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, a fancy golden HP meter that I get to add at, you know, just at the table. It doesn't break any rules as far as I yeah. can tell. Being able to show, generally speaking, on a... Uh, yellow to red scale how badly my character needs healing right now mm -hmm. i like it i think it's pretty i think it's practical and i think it's clever that's that's awesome i really like it too i i kind of think they shouldn't have one for like how many spoons you have left too you know so folks that are like i'm all out of spoons don't uh, i'm down here versus so like yes engage me <laughs> um I, I was showing this to uh, the the crew from adventurous before we recorded our last segment mm-hmm and they had a similar idea of just like how up for the day, like what is your current social HP? Mm -hmm. So the fact that you independently came up with that same idea, I wonder if that's actually something just we all need. Uh, I mean, you should let them know that that should be their next product. It's less nerdy I, in gaming, but it's very useful. I started following them on Instagram, whoever the mm -hmm. event, because like, again, I didn't pick this up. A friend of mine picked it up for me. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, I don't have the link handy. I will yeah. definitely track it down. If I have to shout out to this thing twice in a row, I am more than happy to do that. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, I, Other than the sort of impromptu shout out earlier to Roll for Combat, I don't think I have any others at the moment. So Then uh, thanks for filling in for Param V. You, uh, you're not just the co-host when you fill in for Param. You are also the producer of the show and that... Hey means a lot because if anyone remembers when I had Mark Seifter on one time and I soloed the production and there was no video and I asked him how he was going twice in a row because I could not pay attention to what oh. he was saying and what I had to do. No, no, it was a very entertaining episode just because of how catastrophic some of the things went. But mm -hmm. yes, thank you so much for being here. You uh, not only provided great insight as the co-host, but you also kept the boat afloat. Oh, good. Well, thank you. That darn uh, audio kerfuffle not included, maybe. So, um, hey, no, you dealt with the audio kerfuffle. If I was left alone to deal with a kerfuffle, we, it, we would have just been buried in kerfuffle. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's why I'm looking every which way while we're recording is because I've got actually like three screens up here, all with different elements, right? I've got our video chat. I've got uh, chat from the audience. I've got our actual live feed. I've got uh, the program running the stream down here. So I'm making sure they all... They all sync up and do what they're supposed to do. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Ryan Costello. And I'm Vanessa Hoskins. And if you want to find the path, you need no direction.